I would like to uh, uh, start the uh, session, which is sponsored by the uh, Muslim Student Association and the uh, Muslim Youth of Toledo. My name is Hamid Ghazali. I came from Egypt originally. I am doing my degree in uh, uh, petroleum and civil engineering. I'm also the Imam of the Islamic Center in Lawrence and the coordinator of the Committee of the Religious Dialogue, which is part of a bigger organization that we formed called the Center for Information uh, for Muslim uh, Center for Information International. Let me explain to you why this dialogue first. The idea that we should do our dialogues in a better way. People sometimes run out of time, sometimes somebody raise a point and there is not enough time for the other side to reply and so on. So I really wanted to just make sure that we uh, have uh, a good dialogue format. So I think and I believe this dialogue will help us as they did help me to come to a better understanding of both Christianity and Islam. Uh, we're going to have presentation of 10 minutes by each side. So we're going to start with the Christian presentation and then the Muslim presentation. The first half of these one and a half hours will be from the Christian side objecting to the Muslim understanding of God. They're going to raise objections to the Muslim understanding. And the Muslim side will respond to these objections, and it, which takes about 45 minutes because we started late, we're going to cut it short, about 10 minutes. And then we're going to have another 45 minutes for the, uh, for the Muslims to raise objections to the Christian understanding of uh, the concept of God. And after that, we'll have a questioning panel, which is also people who are experts in both Christianity and Islam, and they will question the four gentlemen over here. So first, we'll have 15 minutes uh, Muslim defend their presentation in front of the Christian questioning panel. And then the Christians will defend their presentation in front of the Muslim questioning panel. And finally, we'll have about 40 minutes of interactive dialogue between you, the audience, and the speakers. We're going to have uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Glisson Arshu, Dr. Robert Douglas, uh, Dr. Jamal Badawi, and Imam Shakir Sayyid in this meeting. So Dr. Glisson Asher is a professor uh, emeritus of Old Testament and Semitic Languages at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. He served as the chairman of the Division of Old Testament. He holds a PhD in Comparative Literature from Harvard Graduate School. He was ordained as a Presbyterian minister and served as a minister for many years. He's the author of several books, including In the Shadow of the Cross, Survey of Old Testament Literature, and a co-editor of several other, including an encyclopedia of Bible difficulties. And in fact, he gave me two pages. I just summarized them in this short sentence, in this short paragraph over here. And Dr. Uh, Robert Douglas is the uh, director of Zwemer Institute for Muslim Studies, and I will let him explain what is Zwemer Institute. Would you do that, Dr. Douglas? Just right now, yeah. This is different than any dialogue you have seen before, so this is the, you're going to expect things like that. Thank you very much. It's a great privilege to come and be a part of this gathering uh, tonight and tomorrow, and uh, I have looked forward to this. Uh, as Hamid said, I am the director of the Zwemer Institute, which is located in uh, Pasadena, California, a suburb of Los Angeles. The Zwemer Institute is an organization that uh, is attempting to help a portion of the Christian community understand Islam. Uh, we find ourselves uh, frequently uh, offering training to people who are going to Muslim areas of the world to live. Uh, some of them are going as missionaries. 
Others are going to do relief and development work, and uh, they come to us to, uh, for us to try to help them understand something of the uh, socio-political, cultural, and religious contexts uh, into which they're going. And uh, we, we always appreciate having that opportunity, and I always appreciate having an opportunity to come and uh, be with a group like you. Thank you. And uh, he holds a PhD in uh, religious studies. Most of the work he did, as he explained to me, dealt with uh, Islamic studies. Uh, he spent many years in the Muslim world and participated in many dialogues and debates with Muslim scholars. The first time I saw him was in 1985, and I was impressed by the speech he gave, and uh, uh, that's why I called him again, and he debated uh, uh, Brother Yusuf Bakus and Ahmad Didat, and I invited, this is the third time, uh, and also Dr. Jamal Badawi before, so they came to know each other through also other dialogues. For the Muslim panel over here, we have Dr. Jamal Badawi, and he's a professor at St. Mary's University, Halifax, Canada. He has extensive experience in religious dialogues. He has produced more than 200 TV programs on Islam. These programs are aired around the world. He is considered a leading Muslim scholar in comparative religion. Uh, he also uh, the founder of the uh, fund, uh, Islamic Information Foundation in Canada, which I would assume uh, most of you know about it, and it deals with uh, propagating good Islamic information and authentic information about Islam in both the Muslim world and for also non-Muslims. And we have uh, Imam Shakir Sayyid, who is uh, the director of the Islamic Teaching Center in Plainfield, Indiana, uh, which is a center who trains and helps Muslim leaders as well as individuals to learn about Islam. Uh, he is also the uh, uh, director of the Educational Committee of ISNA, which is doing a lot of work these days. So you may talk to him about your Islamic school, if you have one, uh, how to start it, and so on. And he's the co-founder of the Center for Islamic Information International, which is part of this program. And uh, may I kindly ask now Dr. Asha to come and make the uh, Christian presentation. I'm really delighted to be with you people tonight in order to accomplish something that I think would be very useful here in America, where we try to understand and appreciate all of the immigrants that come to our shore. My first ancestor in America came over in the Mayflower in 1620. And he was an immigrant fleeing from religious persecution in England. America is a place that anyone can come to, especially people who believe in freedom, freedom to think, freedom to act, freedom of opportunity in uh, business and so on, and in the choice of profession. I think that uh, this is something that we should emphasize, that every wave, and we've had lots of them, we've had Irish waves, we've had German waves, we've had um, Chinese waves, uh, people who've come to join our body politic here in America, and we're proud of it. But one of the things that we need to do when we come into an American atmosphere is to realize that we have the freedom to analyze and to think according to the intelligence that uh, the Lord has given us. And um, one of the essential things that I believe that uh, Hamid Ghazali and I agreed on was to try and clear up misconceptions. And this also has been a concern of um, others who have been active in this panel.
because it is very pointless to refute a position which is not held by the antagonist. And I want to say that uh, this, I think, has to do right with the, uh, the question of the doctrine of God. Now, before I proceed further, I do feel perhaps there's a, a point that I ought to clear up because it has recently come to my attention that uh, recently when uh, 15 students from Trinity visited uh, Dr. Morsi, uh, he uh, was under the impression that uh, although I was very much interested in the whole subject matter, I knew only 40 words of Arabic. Well, I thought perhaps it would be helpful, and I've given these uh, the documents to uh, Dr. Douglas. Uh, he will find in one of the folders 300 pages of double column vocabulary, uh, which I have recorded from my study of the Arabic Bible, and about 100 pages from my study of the Quran. And I don't think that one could cram all of that into the number 40. Uh, but, but this simply is a uh, indication of the keen interest that I have had in the Arabic language, in the Arabic culture. As a matter of fact, I have brought along a collection of early Arabic coins from the time of the Caliphate that some of you might be interested to look at, coming from the very beginning of the uh, Arab realm. I suppose the uh, first interest was excited in me as a boy of 14 when a young man, a fine young man from Palestine um, named uh, Awni Wafa Dajani came to my father's law school in Boston in order to study law. And he became a friend of the family. And I came to recognize especially when I got into the study of the language of the Old Testament, that very, very valuable information comes from the Arabic language. Because the Arabic language represents the earliest, best preserved form of Semitic, with a three-case system, nominative, genitive, and accusative. Three numbers, singular, dual, and plural. And um, a great uh, deal of differentiation in the and the moods or the measures uh, which uh, characterize the Arabic verb. And because of the, and, uh, the preservation of the language, uh, we can gain a great deal of uh, valuable information about the meaning of the languages of the Old Testament, Hebrew and Aramaic. And so it is for this reason that I encourage and urge students wherever I go to take Arabic and I suppose I have taught 20 classes in the course of the last 40 years. And uh, some of them are serving in the various parts of the Arabic-speaking world at present. Now, to get to the question of uh, what we do believe about God, uh, contrary to the impression one would get from certain portions of the Quran, we, do, we are not tritheists. The, uh, one of the things that is uh, emphasized and uh, denounced again and again in the Quran, and I think incorrectly, is that we believe that there are associates with uh, Allah. No, we believe that Allah is one God, and it is proclaimed uh, in the Old Testament and the New, right down to the second chapter of the epistle of James, thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The demons also believe that and they have to tremble. But we do believe that God subsists in three uh, hypostases. That is to say, he subsists as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, not that he ever gave birth to a son. Um, and this, of course, is the thing that uh, Surah 112 um, speaks out against, and I think rightly so. Lam yalad wa lam yulad. He never did give birth, and he was not begotten. We don't believe that. 
We don't believe that he ever begot uh, God the Son. In other words, you have a relationship here which is somewhat metaphorical. Uh, just as you uh, use the term uh, Abu Mal for a person who is wealthy, or uh, other figurative uses of, of father, uh, so also you have in the nature of God, as set forth in the Holy Scripture, one who is Trinitarian. Now, let me point out that according to the first chapter in the Bible, God created man in his own image. And if you stop to think of it, man does not simply consist of one element. He consists of spirit, soul, and bodily nature. So you have there a tripartite composition to man made in the image of God. Now you know very well that uh, there come times when you are in dialogue with yourself, when you face some moral problem, when you have a decision to make, or uh, when a person on Weight Watchers stands before a box of chocolates. Uh, there, there, may in, there may occur a certain uh, tension between what the bodily nature would like to do and what the spirit the intelligence knows it should do. And so, please, uh, disabuse yourself of this mistake in the matter of the doctrine of God. It is reiterated throughout the New Testament as well. Old Testament, New, New Testament. One God, one baptism, one faith I have before me in uh, Ephesians chapter 4. So, uh, what we have to understand is that we have in the scripture a God who cared enough about us, seeing that we were hopelessly lost and unable to save ourselves and uh, unable to change ourselves by our own willpower, unable to follow directions even if we know we should because there's a radical evil in the human heart. God cared enough to intervene and make it possible for him to cleanse us, to make us into new creatures through the transaction on the hill of Calvary where Jesus, who, had, who was the human nature, taken um, and uh, brought together with God the Son, the Son of Man, he became our Messiah, our representative, our uh, atoner, our Savior, so that the whole question of whether God can remain just and forgive the sinner is settled by the fact that God himself in the person of his son and in the body of Jesus of Nazareth paid the full penalty of death for those whom he came to represent and to save. And so uh, this is the kernel of our doctrine of God. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Asher. It was really done in the almost time you wanted. I hope Dr. Jamal Badawi will do the same thing. You can move, please. Mm -hmm. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. All praise is due to Allah, the sole creator sustainer and cherisher of the universe, and may his peace and blessing be upon his last messenger, Muhammad, and upon all messengers and prophets before him. I greet you all with the greeting of all of the prophets. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace, blessing, and mercy of Allah Almighty be with you all. Uh, the uh, meeting here tonight and tomorrow between two communities, Muslims and Christians, is very encouraging not only because both are part of the human family, not only because both of them inhabit the same global village, but more importantly because both of them identify themselves with the ethical monotheism of Prophet Abraham, in basically centered in the belief in the one true creator, sustainer, and cherisher of the universe. God in English, Allah, in Arabic, Dieu in French, Gott in German. There are at least three common beliefs 
from my perspective that I believe unite these two communities. First, that they believe that God is not a myth, God is not a dry and impersonal, remote philosophical concept. God is not identical with the universe he created as the pantheist may hold. God is not one who created the universe and then retired and became inactive in history. God is not a despotic being who demands obedience only for his own benefit and ego and enjoys punishing and tormenting his creatures. As the Quran says, ما يفعل الله بعذابكم إن شكرتم وأمنتم What would God do with punishing you if indeed you are believers and grateful? The second fundamental belief I consider to be common is the belief that while the nature or essence of God is beyond our comprehension, as the Quran says, ليس كمثله شيء, nothing is comparable unto him, we can relate to God's divine attributes as he revealed to us through prophets and other means. Some of those attributes of God relate to his personal relationship with mankind, attributes such as love, mercy, and forgiveness. Yet there are also parallel attributes of God that both communities believe in, the majesty of God, his transcendence, supremacy, his creation, power, perfect knowledge and wisdom, pervading presence, justice, righteousness, and holiness. The third common belief, I believe, is that both communities have a common faith that God and belief in God is not a mere dogma, but an experience of closeness to God, experience of love, trust, and willing submission that faith should be dynamic and gives life a true sense of direction. However, there is one or two issues that deserve to be considered quite carefully when both communities claim to be monotheist. In fact, the Arabic term is not exactly equivalent to monotheism. It is the Arabic term Tawheed. And Tawheed is much more than simple monotheism. For in monotheism, the basic belief is that there is only one God who created the universe and created all of us. And as Dr. Arsha said, even the Satan and the devils even believe in that. Mm -hmm. It is a belief that is held by Muslims, Christian, Jews, and there are many followers of other religions also who believe that God is one. But this is a necessary but insufficient condition for the stricter definition of Tawheed in Islam, which is more than monotheism. Because in addition to that condition, there are three important conditions. First, that God is not only one numerically, but he is also one in essence and person. And this excludes any notion of hypostasis or persons or divine persons within the same Godhead. Neither tritheism nor trinity, both are addressed in the Quran, not one or the other. Neither tritheism nor trinity, however explained, uh, is compatible with Islamic Tawheed. The second additional condition is that God alone is worthy of worship and unqualified devotion, which means that none is to be worshipped instead of him, none is to be worshipped alongside with him as his co-equal, nor is God to be worshipped through any of his creatures, including the greatest of all prophets, the greatest five, Noah, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, or Muhammad, peace be upon them all. The third condition is that any attribute of shortcoming, man-like weakness or limitation is not befitting for the glory of God. In fact, one, fa one aspect that we all realize, even non-Muslims, non-Christians believe, is that as human beings we have shortcomings. We are incomplete. And as such, we cannot have the full comfort and the full trust unless we lean on someone who is absolutely complete 
absolutely perfect from any weakness that is attributable to humans or other creatures. And that excludes any notion of God incarnate who is in a physical body who can be uh, insulted or beaten or you know, led by others. Uh, anything of that nature we feel as Muslims is inconsistent with the majesty of God. To the Muslim, any deviation from any of these conditions can be called shirk, S-H-I-R-K. Many of our uh, non-Muslim friends translate shirk as polytheism. I don't think this is correct. Linguistically, shirk comes from association, which means to associate any being with God, the only God, in any of his exclusive divine attributes. To say that there is anyone who is co-equal with God, co-eternal with God, or have the same powers or same divinity as God, is a clear violation of Muslim understanding of Tawheed. Muslim believe that this uncompromising and pure monotheism is the long-standing tradition before Islam even. It is the teaching of all of the prophets throughout history. In fact, Muslims see the last prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, as the universal prophet to all mankind, as the restorer, clarifier of this pure monotheism that all prophets taught. In fact, the Quran warns against any form of shirk. And just to give two examples, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَغْفِرُ أَنْ يُشْرَكَ بِهِ وَيَغْفِرُ مَا دُونَ ذَلِكَ لِمَنْ يَشَاءُ God or Allah will never forgive, never forgive that anyone associate others, other creatures of his, even great prophets, with him in his exclusive divine attributes, but he would forgive anything short of that. The Quran quotes one great prophet, Jesus, peace be upon him, as saying, and said Jesus, the son of Mary, O children of Israel, worship God, my Lord and your Lord. For whosoever joins or associates others with God in his divine attributes, his abode will be the hellfire and God will forbid paradise to him for the wrongdoers in the day of judgment, they will find no helper and no supporter. Just to give a few examples of the, from the Quran, very briefly, God is described as forgiving, full of loving compassion, the Arabic word wadud, full of loving compassion, close to mankind, qareeb. In fact, one Bedouin Arab came to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, to ask, is God the Lord so far or remote that we have to shout on him to hear us? Or is he near enough to have the intimate relationship with him? And the answer came in the Quran, not in the word of the Prophet Muhammad, in the word of God himself. It says, when my servants ask you, O Muhammad, concerning me, then certainly I am near to them. I respond to anyone who calls upon me. Let them respond to my call and follow my guidance that they may be led aright. God begets not, nor was begotten, and nothing is like him or comparable unto him. God is the living, the self-sustaining, the eternal. No slumber can seize him nor sleep. His are all things in heavens and on earth. God, there is no God but him, the knower of the invisible and the visible, most beneficent, most merciful, the sovereign, the holy one, source of peace, the protector, the guardian, the majestic. He is God, the creator, the evolver, the bestower of all forms. To him belongs the most beautiful names, whatever in heavens and on earth declare his praises and glory. He is mighty and wise. Salaam alaikum. Thank you, Dr. Jamal. And uh, the next part of the program would be the interactive dialogue. And I would kindly ask the uh, Christian panel, Dr. Ashur and Dr. Douglas, to start the dialogue by raising objections or, you know, whatever they think of the Muslim belief in God. And then the Muslims will respond. I would 
just give you about maximum of two minutes and the Muslim side maximum of four minutes at one time. Hopefully you cut it in less than two minutes. But let's say we won't go more than four minutes at a time. And two minutes for the Christian side at a time. I uh, must say that the attributes which um, uh, Jamal Badawi emphasized, I heartily concur in. Uh, I think that all of these attributes of God are reflected in the Bible as well as in the Quran. The thing that distresses me, though, is to um, realize that we have to be accused of holding, some, holding to a view that we do not hold to. There's no shirk at all in our Christian position. We uh, believe that God uh, consists of three elements, a naqim, a, a kanab, uh, uh, akanim. akanim, or hypostases, and that these constitute one person just as truly as our own uh, triune nature constitutes a human being. And uh, I, I think it is pointless to berate someone for holding to a belief that he does not hold to. Now, you may find it rather difficult to understand how one could talk about Trinity without uh, uh, indulging in shirk, but we do not believe, I never have believed, that God had associates, but rather that he consists in these three hyp uh, hypostatical elements in his nature. Now, um, you may say, oh, there's a logical problem here. But I'm telling you that the Christian position is that God is one. And I'm interested to observe that uh, one uh, eminent imam, um, I, I forget what his name is. I, I've got a flyer here. He acknowledges that uh, Christians do believe in one God. And that the, oh, here we are, it's Imam uh, Dean Muhammad says Christians believe in one God also. And I think we might as well be realistic and not uh, uh, insist that other people are holding a view they do not hold. We can't make any progress that way. I'd like to clarify further that I didn't say in my presentation that shirk means only means only that God has associates. I was careful in defining it clearly by saying to associate others with God in his exclusive divine attributes. And I don't think that Dr. Arshal would deny that the Christians say that Jesus coexisted with God as the, in the beginning was the, the word, the word was with God that Jesus participated in creation, these are commonly held. This is, according to Muslim definition, is a clear case of shirk, because it associates a creature of God, a human being, and attribute to him the same eternal divine qualities that are exclusive of God alone. So I'm not talking about something that Christians don't believe. I am addressing things that Christians also profess to believe. Uh, for the remaining minutes, I think uh, Brother uh, Shakir would like to. Uh, in fact, I'm so pleased to hear that Dr. Asher is willing to say that he, as a Christian, only believes what Muslims believe. Because that takes care of this night's discussion, at least. If you really believe that God is only one, he is the only divine one, there is nothing like unto him, he does not beget, nor is he begotten, uh, I think you have confessed to be, in essence, a Muslim, and that makes me very pleased. Uh, not for the fact that you are coming to our fold, uh, in particular, which also makes one happy, but for the fact that a scholar in your place coming to say that this Islamic belief is the correct one, and Christians do believe that way, that should make a Muslim happy. However, and I will not make it long, uh, the Bible held 
the position that there are three who bear witness in heaven. The Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. If these three are not numeric, and th if this is not shirk, maybe you have a different definition of what shirk is. Number two, how can God, who is defined in the Bible as invisible, mix up with Jesus, who is visible? How can the indefinite God mix up with the definite human being? While the Bible itself says that God is greater than man. God is greater than all. How can the greater than all come to manifest himself in someone who identified himself in the Bible saying, but I am no more than a womb, which means a tiny creature. So uh, if, if you come to say, no, we hold the position of Islam and all of this is, is not our belief, then that's a new position for me to understand. Thank you. Yes, I think uh, there, I think we have another field that we have to explain, and that is the incarnation. Uh, I don't know of anybody who feels that Jesus was uh, the creator, but rather it is the logos, the kalima, and, the, and it's the kalima the law, who is the creator. Jesus did not come really into play until he was conceived in the womb of the Virgin Mary. He was God the Son and remained God the Son, but was united, divine nature, human nature. The human nature, Christ, was not eternal, but he came to be our representative, only a human being could be a proper representative of fallen man at the cross. So again, I think you are assuming something that we do not believe when you say that we think that Jesus was eternal. He is Jesus Christ. Now, and, and uh, prior to the incarnation, he was the Word of God the life-giving, the, the creating word of God. Carry back to love. So let's, uh, let's be honest with uh, this type of discussion. And again, do not impute belief that we do not hold. Okay. If we replay what Dr. Archer just said, and I wrote it word for word, he's saying it is the locus, the kalima, and not Jesus. And he went back to say, but Jesus before his birth, he was the locus, he was the creating kalima. And let us be honest, which means let us confuse what we're saying. In fact, if you say that he was the locus, the creating word of God, then he is creator as well. If you say he is not, then how do you interpret John 1.1? 1, 1? Well, the whole point is that God <clears throat> eternally existed in, in, as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And it was through the Son that all things were created according to the teaching of Scripture. This is what the shirk is about. Now, Jesus was a name that was announced to Joseph and to Mary prior to his conception in the womb when he was... Um, started by the power of direct power of God, which is also stated in the Quran. And uh, therefore you are confusing the, uh, the term or the name Jesus when you uh, take it uh, to any point before his birth, before his conception in the womb. The thing that we'd like really to understand here in the midst of all of this, who is Jesus? Is it not true that Christians believe that Jesus is the Word of God? Would well, you say that Jesus is the Word of God? Well, he, you have a hypostatic union there. Okay. All right. Yeah. Now, the question here is this. Is it not true also that in the definition of the Trinity, that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit 
are equal in power. Right. That the father, the father is God in his own right. The son is God in his own right. The Holy Spirit is God in his own right. But so goes the creed. But they are not three eternals. They are one eternal. That's right. Now we have a question here. If they are equal in power, then how come one is the father and one is the son? For definitely the son is not equal to the father. The father is not equal to the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is not equal to the son. The uh, father begat, according to John 3.16, for God to love the word, he gave his only begotten. The word begotten is used in King James, even though it was expunged in uh, the revised standard version of the Bible. So the functions of the three are not the same. How could they be equal? And if they are equal in power, who is to decide what to be done? No matter how much unity is there, once you get three, you get superior and inferior, you get subordinate and principal, obviously you don't get equality. And since God is absolute, nobody is greater than God, then the two others are not gods. So it is just an impossibility to keep thinking or speak about the three equal uh, persons in the divine nature or divine godhood without getting into a very serious problem of consistency. Uh, if I may add one thing, <coughs> irrespective of the logic, who is greater and who is not, if the Bible said on the tongue of Jesus Christ that God is greater than all, God is greater than I, for whatever God knows, I don't know. In, on my own power, I can do nothing. By my own knowledge, I know nothing. He is putting himself so much down. Not only that, but also he himself said that whosoever sins against the Holy Spirit, he will not be forgiven. He will never be forgiven. But this who sins against the Son, he will be forgiven. So Jesus is making literal logical distinctions between himself and the Father, between himself and the Holy Spirit. And you are saying, but they are united and only one and equal. The Bible doesn't say this. May I just direct the uh, discussion a little bit, Dr. Douglas, before you talk. Remember that it's your turn to raise objections against the Muslim understanding, not the opposite. So please keep this in mind. This is your time because they're going to have their turn and they're going to come back with questions like that. Well, one of my objections would simply be that uh, in this whole discussion, and, and uh, Muslims certainly have the right to do this, but Muslims have given a definition to Tawheed, and they have then said Christians must conform to that, and if they don't, then somehow their belief is not really true. So uh, the first problem we have is simply a problem of language. And, uh, and what words mean. Now, uh, you know, one is one is one is one. Uh, is that logical? Well, possibly, but even mathematic, uh, mathematical theory today is beginning to question its own basis in some ways. But the point is, if we start out with a certain presupposition or assumption and expect others, in effect, to conform to it, then it's, it's not going to happen. And I would, I would uh, uh, simply say that, uh, that I have a problem with the rather mathematical kind of definition uh, of God that, uh, that Islam has set forth. Can I? Just two quick responses to this. First of all, we didn't say that Christians must conform to Muslim definition of Tawheed. We simply say for us as Muslims, this is the definition of true monotheism or Tawheed. Christians are definitely free to conform or not. This is their own choice. We're not saying that they must do that. Say this is our understanding. And this comes in response to what Dr. Harshan mentioned earlier, that he says basically that uh, Muslims really do not understand the Christians, that Christians are not mushriks, are not committing shirk. So I am saying no. You may believe this, but from our standpoint as Muslims, from the standpoint of the Qur'an, they are committing a very serious form of shirk, which was also disapproved by Jesus himself, as we quoted from the Qur'an. We didn't say you must conform. Maybe one important thing to say here is that Muslims did not invent mathematics in identifying God. When Jesus was asked, what is the most important commandment of God, he said, 
that hear, O Israel, your God is one. So before Muhammad was born, Jesus started mathematics. So when we ask the Christians to adhere to mathematics, it is a mathematics that Jesus instructed them to follow. So we're not coming with any new idea. The second point that's very important is the Bible is full of the same basic principles of belief that the Muslims are upholding. All what Muhammad did is to come to restore monotheism. He did not come to invent a religion. Muhammad came to say Jesus was right on his own grounds. But those after him, who wrote after him, attributed the word to him. Those that he will despise on the day of judgment say, uh, do you know, haven't I uh, preached in your name? Haven't I healed in your name? And he will say, depart from me. Those who claim to be followers of Jesus Christ, but not really followers of his instructions, are the ones who have to answer. Well, I would respond back to you by saying, uh, yes, Jesus uh, spoke of God as one, but then if we're going to operate out of the, of the context of the Bible and the New Testament, then the definition of one in the New Testament is, is uh, not the definition that, uh, that you're talking about. Um, and I would agree, you're not saying that Christians must believe that or adhere to that. But... Uh, uh, let's let's let Jesus and the New Testament, if we're going to say Jesus talked about oneness, let's let Jesus define oneness. And then as Muhammad comes along, if he chooses to define it another way, that's another issue. I guess I would also say, and, and Dr. Badawi did this seven years ago, uh, quoted John 3.16, this stuff about uh, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son and then talks about that expression being purged from the uh, uh, later translations like the Revised Standard Version. Uh, clearly the term begotten is there in John 3.16 in the King James Version. No question about it. But it is not there in the original text and never has been. This is an issue of translation. So quit saying that. That's like me quoting an Arab, an English translation of the Quran to you and saying the Quran says, and you say, but now the Arabic says, and the translator in struggling with that didn't quite get it. So don't say that anymore or I'm going to have to say, why do you keep saying that? When Christian scholarship says it's not there, you're making a cheap point. I did it se seven years ago. I said it again. I will say it again for a very good reason. If you go back to the church councils that defined the Trinity, they were very clear about it. And when they spoke about Jesus, they say, begotten, not made. Begotten, not made. Right. If you want to go back to the original, yeah. we might as well throw away all these additions, including the Trinity, that was invented many decades after Jesus, and let's go back to basics again. Secondly, you're talking also about defining Trinity or defining oneness in the New Testament. But is it not true also that Jesus said, I came not to destroy the law or prophet, I came to fulfill? Is it not true that the belief in the Old Testament is part of the belief of Christians? How do we find that definition in the Old Testament? This is an issue perhaps that needs to be discussed and responded to. I wish you could. And, and, and it does, and Gleason wants to respond to that. But let me, let me back, to the, uh, back to the creeds. You're doing the same thing, Jamal. Because the creeds say, uh, uh, quote it for me. <laughs> Come on. Okay. Quote, quote the creed for the, fa the Father is eternal, the Son is eternal, the Holy Spirit is eternal, but they are not three eternal, they are one eternal. No, the no, Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God, but they are not three gods, they are one God. That's not right. And then God, it, Jesus, is begotten, not made. Okay, begotten, begotten, not made. My friend, that is an English translation of the creed that was written in Greek, and in Greek, 
It says monogenes, John 3.16. It does not say begotten in the sense of uh, sexual relationships. So you're doing the same thing with the creed. That's what I'm saying. I well, say it, the, the point, it the, say that the main issue in the Christian creed was to ascertain that Jesus is not made. That's right. But, but that's right. But the creed, the creed is not uh, is not in any way saying that he was uh, made. Uh, that's the, the creed is trying to set that forth, as John three sixteen is setting that forth that he's not made. Okay. I think what we have here is a confusion uh, regarding the uh, the relationship between Jesus, Son of Man, and Christ. God the Son. If you fail to see the relationship between them, then you're going to get confused with subordinationism and all that kind of thing. Now, what I read in Philippians 2 is this. I think it clarifies it perhaps as well as any passage. Um, have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Here then you have the mission for which God came into the world in a hypostatic union between God the Son and the Son of Man. Jesus constantly used the term Son of Man in regard to his messianic mission. Now if he had not taken unto himself a human uh, person, then it would have been impossible for there to be any atonement made. There could have been no price given for the sins of fallen mankind. And therefore, those two things must not be confused as God the, as, uh, God the Son, co-eternal, say equal in power and glory. But, uh, Dr. Rasha, would you make yes. sure to? Okay, but uh, the point is, the, the, the miracle of the Incarnation made it possible for Allah to come down to us in the form of man and do for man what man could not do for himself, pay for his own sin. Basic things. Number one, the Bible said that God is not a God of confusion. So whatever brings confusion is not God and is not from God. So if you want to tell me they are eternal, but that is not shirk of divine attributes, then what is shirk? Dr. Badaw introduced shirk in the beginning, saying that shirk could be in the form of attributing to somebody the divine attributes of God. Dr. Arsha just finished saying that they are both eternal. They both hold divine attributes. That is particularly shirk. And I'm not able to emphasize it more than that. But I'm able to say this. Confusion is not from God according to the Bible. Number two, Jesus drew a lot of lines of distinction between himself and God. In terms of power, I said that. In terms of knowledge, I said that. In terms of eternity, and I said that. But you're saying no. So you are quoting Philippians. And I'm quoting Jesus. Whom do you believe in, Paul or Jesus? Jesus is the... Uh, uh, Paul's doctrine all came from the Lord Jesus. He is so affirmed in the first chapter of Galatians. Okay. And therefore, what Paul spoke, he spoke under the inspiration of God. Great. This has always been the understanding. Now, so far as the term begotten is concerned, I have pointed this out in previous encounters. I'll have to repeat it before this audience. In Greek, the term monogenes 
came through in two different spellings. You keep the mic a little bit far from me. Big pardon? Give it about six inches, that mic, so that... I'm too close? Yes. Yeah, all right. Um, if you have two nus, genes, then you have a term that is related to genao, which means the function of the father in uh, begetting a son. However, the best manuscript reading is one nu, so that in monogenes is not related to genao, to give birth, but to genos, which means a, a, a kind or a type. And therefore, monogenes simply means unique. And it is so translated in the Latin Vulgate, filium suum unicum. And so we don't need to wo uh, worry about the term begotten. Uh, now, in the, uh, in the Nicene Creed, of course, when it states that Christ uh, was, it was not created, this, of course, indicated that he was part of God. And uh, what you have to do, and I, I realize that this is such a wonderful, uh, a marvelous solution to the problem of sin and the righteousness of God, uh, that it's hard for the human mind to grasp. It always has been. But what God did, he cared enough to enter into our world and pay the sin price that was necessary in order that we might be forgiven. That is what the incarnation is all about. And that's what, uh, what we believe. And now so far as um, the matter of the tripartite nature, I still insist that if you have at the same time a spirit, a soul, and a bodily nature, this does not make you a confusion. It makes you composite, to be sure, but you're still the one and same individual. So also is God, as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Try and understand, that's, that's what we really believe. Don't impute to us views that we do not hold. If Muslims are the ones who don't understand the Trinity, let me give you a few quotations from Christian scholars. One, by admitting these three they call persons, they admit a plurality of beings, a plurality of entities, a plurality of essences, a plurality of substances, and taking the words of God strictly, they may have plurality of gods. Another one, it is impossible to speak about three supreme beings. The moment we speak of three numerical persons, it means that there must be three individual essences. The essence of God is one not only in kind, but also in number. And then he goes on to say that the two mutually, the two nature of Christ being God and man are impossible because you combine two mutually exclusive characteristics. The, the finite and the infinite, the mortal and the immortal, the mutable and the immutable, and others. I believe, okay, let me skip this one for brevity. Another one, a revelation is a gift of light. It cannot thicken our darkness and multiply our perplexity. The doctrine itself means the Trinity, as has been clearly demonstrated, has proved impossible for reasonable men to accept or even hold in their minds as it implies contradictions which render it meaningless. I could go on and on, and I don't think this is not something that is limited to Muslims. I think the whole notion of trying to say that Jesus simultaneously was full God and full human at the same time is a simple contradiction. Before you go any further, I want uh, Dr. Arsha and Dr. Douglas uh, I would finally ask you to state a few points, your objections, one, two, three, four. And let us deal with these four because we have only 10 minutes to finish your objections. So I would kindly ask you to state the objections so far. Well, my principal concern in the um, view of God that is set forth in the Quran is that there is no way in which God can rightly forgive sin without requiring retribution. Um, because man 
needs to be transformed from a self-seeking creature that he starts out life to be, and then everything that he does in relationship to God would be from a self-seeking motive rather than a true surrender. The surrender that, of course, is implied in the term Islam is only possible when we understand that God cared enough to bring about the incarnation so that a sacrifice of infinite value might be presented on the cross since he who died there was both God and man, although, of course, the God part of him did not die. But the man did die in order that he might give life to us. He had paid the penalty in full as our substitute. So I have a problem with, uh, I mean, every surah you begin, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, uh, but you do not show how the compassion and the mercy of God was made effectual for our salvation. If you simply uh, set down a list of rules, a uh, set of uh, religious exercises that you can go through, or mountains that you run to and throw and, uh, uh, near Mecca and throw stones and go through all kinds of things like that, that does not seem to be addressing the real problem of the radical evil of the human heart which can only be changed when there is the miracle of the new birth, when God the Holy Spirit takes over the mind and possesses the being of a forgiven sinner who becomes a child of God. Uh, with all due respect, this sounds very nice as a sermon or a preaching, but when it really boils down to the main question of forgiveness, the question the Muslim raises, why not? Why not? Yes, God is merciful and is just, but according to Islam, his mercy is far in abundance than his justice and wrath. And in fact, this is a topic that we're coming to tomorrow. Inshallah, I give you a lot more on that and tell you why not. The cross is not the way, as Muslims believe. There is much better way that we can relate to God and seek forgiveness. Secondly, when you're speaking about uh, the man Jesus dying on the cross, but not the God, I think that seems to violate what the early church councils defined when they said that these three persons together are conjoined without separation. Conjoined without separation. If somebody dies on the cross, we cannot say the son died, but the father and the Holy Spirit are still living because all three are conjoined without separation. That means God was dead on the cross. And I don't think this is a belief of any of the Abrahamic faiths. Thirdly, I think you're missing the point in the matter of worship in Islam, and I'm glad again to clarify that confusion. The purpose of worship in Islam is not to go through the rituals. If you read the Quran carefully, since you know Arabic, when it speaks about prayers, it says, in the Prayer restrain the person from evil and indecency, which means if you go through the motions, there is no prayer accepted. If you read the Quran, when it describes or imposes or requires the Muslim to fast, it says, You fast in order to attain self-control and piety, relationship with God. When it speaks about charity, it speaks about charity with sincerity and says, if you do it for show off, you don't get reward for it. And the word zakat means purification. It's mm -hmm. spiritual purif purification before it is payment of money. The hajj that you described as throwing stones, again, you're, you're missing the point because the Quran itself, when it speaks about hajj also, that hajj can be, must be done فَلَا رَفَثَ وَلَا فُسُوخ There should be no indecency in word or action. That this is a training on obedience to God, symbolical of defeating evil forces within ourselves. So I think you're missing the whole point be, be, uh, be, you know, beyond or behind these acts of worship as if it were just formalistic or ritualistic acts. They are not. So there are a lot of better ways, Muslim believe, of reconciling the human to the Creator. But like I said, this is the topic that's coming tomorrow. So that let's focus on divinity. Okay. Yeah, what's the next objection? Do you have any response, Dr. Marashir, to that? Well, I think that uh, I would like to wait until tomorrow when we can go into it uh, more thoroughly. And I, I uh, think this could be one of the most important parts of our weekend discussion. What would be the next objection, Dr. Douglas and Dr. Asher?
Well, whether it is by way of objection or not, maybe it's by way of asking for clarification. As uh, earlier you, uh, you talked about the, the attributes of God, uh, th this is simply a, a, way of get, a way of trying to get at and ask for some clarification from you. Uh, God is merciful. God is loving. God is just. Whatever other attributes you want to lay out there. And I would say, yes, that, that is true. But what, what do those words mean to a Muslim? What does it mean when you say God is merciful? Um, how can you explain that without somehow having to use human language with all of its analogies and limitations? I mean, tell me, tell me what mercy is and, and do it without any sort of of, of human point of reference. My answer to that is very simple and give to Brother Shaker to complete. I return the question. Tell me as a Christian what mercy means, what justice means. I think for Christianity, Islam, and Judaism for that matter, there is something known as the analogical language. God has to communicate to us higher spiritual truth that our human languages are inadequate to fully express, yet he has to communicate to us in some form. So yes, God is merciful. It's a problem of definition, not only for Muslims, for Christians, and for anyone else. But definition can be understood perhaps by referring to the Quran. If I have time, I can give you more explanation of what mercy means in the Quran, but just give you one. In Rabbi Rahimun Wadud, God is merciful, most loving, and it, so it connects mercy with the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So mercy is one manifestation of the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In other verses in the Quran, it ties between mercy of God and forgiveness. His willingness to forgive without bloodshed, without substitutionary theories, without any confusion. God knows our nature, knows our weakness, and one aspect of his mercy is his willingness to forgive us because he knows our shortcoming. But this is only scratching the surface. I'm not going to go deeper than the surface, of course, because it is a deep issue. But I would like just to make these comments. One, the human language that we are using, according to Islam, is a language that God taught man. Man did not invent the language. God taught Adam every single thing to say and to do. So when we use the human language, communicating with one another, it is a language that God knows. We did not invent it. Second, using the term mercy in Islam, and I sort of like smell the hinting that if God is merciful in Islam, what does he do with his mercy to you? How can his mercy help you? For us Christians, we say God is love, and for us love is that he laid himself for us. My answer to that is simple. If God did not die on the cross, which a Christian do, do not believe he did, Christians do not believe that God died on the cross, then it is a man, Jesus, who did. But before he did, he was praying earnestly to God, saying, please, if this cup can be taken away from me, take it. He was not willing, not as a human, not as a part of Godhead, not as a ransom, he refused. So, who laid himself for us on the cross? Is it God or is it the reluctant man, Jesus? For us, the mercy of God is very encompassing. I know it is the same for a Christian, a Jew, anybody, anybody who loves God and relates to him, God will relate back to him. This is in fact what the Bible says, what the Quran said, the New and the Old Testament equally alike. But now to draw a distinction, to put Christianity standing out apart, that uh, for Christianity love means a lot because we are saved, and what saves you? The answer is my question. Who died on the cross? Thank you. Uh, we have 
In fact, we have two minutes for this segment of the program. So I would kindly ask you either to make a follow-up or a new point. Well, I simply want to point out that Jesus... Is it a new point or a... I'm following up what okay. he said. Um, Jesus, when he said, let this cup pass from me, was simply battling with temptation, which he overcame when he said, nevertheless, not thy will, but uh, not my will, but thine be done. I don't think you have read the whole account so as to take that in, uh, into consideration. He did go to the cross willingly. He did not uh, defend himself before Pontius Pilate or before Caiaphas, and uh, he refused to speak in his defense. He went voluntarily to the cross because of the love that was in him for you and me that he might pay what we could not pay in the way of the penalty for sin. Can I can make one quick comment. Dr. Usher is saying that Jesus went voluntarily and willingly. But here, Jesus on the cross, after he went, he was talking to God according to the Bible, which we refuse completely, saying, God, God, why thou hast forsaken me? A person who in the beginning prayed three times, saying, Take that cup away from me three consecutive times on three spots in his trip to the cross. And then when he reaches the cross, he, he didn't say, Oh, I'm giving my life for your sins. He didn't say this on the cross. The moment that he could have gotten and acquainted everybody with the faith is the moment that he himself turned against God allegedly by the Bible saying, Why did he leave me alone? Why did he forsake me? Something that we reject. We don't believe that Jesus would have said it had he been taken to the cross at the first place. Secondly, we believe that the two statements, and in the middle there is a statement that you added, and I really wanted you to add that, that he said, not my will, but thy will, which means Jesus knew and understood completely the concept of submission in Islam. Mm -hmm. Man submits his own will to the will of his creator. This what Jesus was, a Muslim. Thank you. We'll, we'll take a final comment over here. We the comment should be to the Muslim side, but we'll let you do it. Yeah, well, you see, he's raised something that uh, deserves an answer. When Jesus uh, spoke on the cross, Lama uh, Eli, Eli, Lama Lama Shabakhtani, yes. he was repeating the first verse of Psalm 22, in which the crucifixion is set forth prophetically. He was fulfilling the role of the Redeemer. And believe me, part of the penalty that comes to a guilty mankind is complete separation from God. He had to experience that as our representative. But if you follow the rest of what he said on the cross, when he said, into thy hands I commit my spirit, it is finished. And you, you have him ending up in triumph as the willing sacrifice for sinners. Yes, go ahead. Just one uh, quick comment. Uh, the statements mentioned by Jesus on the cross according to the Gospels are in conflict. And what Dr. Arsha did perhaps was to collect it together and put it together. One version say it is finished. One version say, uh, God, God, why have you forsaken me? The ending is not always the same. Uh, even what was written on the cross is different. There are different versions of that, so we can't take that as explanatory of the other. The thing that uh, amazes me indeed is that uh, Brother Shakir raised a very logical and simple point. Why would Jesus say, God, God, why have you forsaken me? Because we know many courageous individuals who are not up to the level of the prophets, who won't leave, uh, lose trust in God in these trying moments. And to respond to that, to simply say he did that in order to fulfill the prophecy that was in, the, uh, the, in, the, uh, in Psalm 22, uh, sounds rather a strange kind of reasoning. Secondly, if we refer back to Psalm 22, even though it has the statement, God, God, why have you forsaken me? 
there are two observations on it. One, if you read the psalm incomplete, incomplete, not just pick one verse or the other, you find that that righteous servant of God who's praying actually has been saved by God and those who try to trap him are the ones who have been disgraced. Read it in full, not just pick one line. Secondly, as many biblical scholars themselves admit, that that statement, God, God, why have you forsaken me, is totally taken out of context because this was the cry of Prophet David when the Amalekites invaded the city of Ziklag, killed many people, and took and made cast lots on two of his wives. So it's taken totally out of context. But still the answer has not been heard as to why would a person who is willingly and knows that this is his mission say, God, God, why have you forsaken me? Uh, one, one more thing to, to add here, maybe you can answer to all of this together, is that it is also mentioned in the Old Testament that God does not demand sacrifice, nor does he demand blood. This is the law that was laid before Jesus. This is a law that he came to fulfill. How is it that his whole mission turned into a mission of giving his own blood, and if his own blood was given as a human, then what value does it carry? If it was given as God, then you didn't answer me again, who died on the cross? If you say God, then how? If you say Jesus, then what value does it carry? If you say that Jesus was with God before, and Jesus himself had a date of birth, and a date of ending his mission, how do you reconcile all of that together? I think we will just have to move to the se second segment. So could you start, please, r raising your sure. concerns? Well, okay. This, okay. however, is an important point that deserves So you want to make a follow-up? Oh, yes. Okay, go ahead. All right. In the first place, the Psalm 22 cannot possibly be reconciled with the Ziklag incident. There is no time when they were piercing David's hands and feet. And uh, if you study it, you'll, you'll see that this is something where David is speaking prophetically. And the prophecy is being fulfilled by Christ as the son of David. Now, the point is that Jesus did not simply die as other human beings would die. He died as sinless. And no human being, Adam included, has ever been sinless except for Jesus. This is the whole point of the virgin birth, that he did not inherit the sin through the male line. And so what you have is a sacrifice which was first foreshadowed the very first time Abel offered the lamb upon the altar, the innocent for the guilty. This has been the plan right from the very beginning. And you have chapter after chapter in the Bible describing how a blood sacrifice is to be carried on. Why? Because that was looking forward to the merit of the one uh, effectual sacrifice that was performed in Calvary. And this is brought out in the epistle to the Hebrews. There's no problem here. I think uh, you raised a number of points, and I think as a, as a scholar of the Old Testament, I think, or I'm sure you realize, that some biblical scholars disagree with the translation, pierced my hands and feet, and actually they say the original reads, like a lion took me by hand and feet, number one. Number two, suppose you disagree even with their conclusion as scholars, the piercing of hands and feet may not necessarily mean a prophecy of what's going to happen on the cross. It is an allegory also of the pain and suffering in which Prophet David was going through. Thirdly, you said that Jesus was the only sinless person because he did not inherit sin through the male side. Did he inherit sin through the female side or are females non-humans? Was his mother a different level of creature that she could not inherit through her genes, the sin as well. Finally, I refer you to a very well-known biblical scholar, Dennis Nineham, 
who, while he believes in Jesus, but he's just as a critical, honest scholar, he says, how could people make such a categorical statement that Jesus was absolutely and completely sinless? On what basis? He said the only basis they have is only three weeks of his life. Because he says, if you put together all the events in the Gospels about what Jesus did or said, which towns he went, excluding the 40 days that he spent in the wilderness about which we don't have enough information anyway. It would come to no merely about three weeks. And there is a big blanket about what happened in his life. And he said, as a scholar, he said, I'm not raising any question about Jesus, but I'm simply saying on what objective ground can we take three weeks of the life of a person and say absolutely sinless. Secondly, he raises a point that a Muslim, a Muslim even would not dare say. I'm not, I'm not referring to a Muslim statement. This is Dennis Nineham. He said, for example, when we read in the New Testament that a woman dried the feet of Jesus with her hair, with her hair, he says, if he's indeed full man, as Christians believe, a full man, not an unusual person, not someone who is impotent or anything, is it really impossible to say that uh, the sensation of the soft hair of the woman drying his feet would not arouse any feeling in him? said, how do we know when Jesus looked at a woman, for example, that he did not at least feel attraction to her as a human being, if he's indeed a full human? And then he says, I'm not raising these issues to raise any question about the sexual purity of Jesus. I'm only telling those who try to pre present Jesus as if he's just like a sort of uh, angel floating rather than to emphasize the full humanity of the man, the human being, Jesus, peace be upon him. Uh, and if you mean by sinless, uh, okay, very quick. If you mean by sinless that a, a prophet must have certain qualities to communicate the mission of God, then not only Jesus, not only Jesus, but all prophets of God are sinless in that sense, but not in the absolute sense. That's an impossibility. Or else they're not human. Uh, may I add one point? Well, just I, very quickly. Very quickly. I would well, kindly ask you just to wait until we... Just, I want to move to the second part. Uh, you know, you're going to get stuck in one point. No, no, no. It, it will be just half a minute. Very quickly. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, you mentioned that Jesus is really without sin, and we would love for him to be. But the Bible mentioned one story. When he spoke to his mother when she was standing by, trying to speak to him, and she said, What do I have to do with you women? Shouting at his mother. In Islam, the Quran says, Don't you dare say to any of your parents, Don't you say it. No matter how upset you are. So if in Islam it counts as a sin for the human being, the normal human being, me and you as a Muslim, then I think it does. Also, Melchizedek is mentioned as a man with no father, no mother, no beginning of days, no ends, and no sins as well. And he is mentioned in the Bible. So it is not only Jesus who is referred to in the Bible as sinless. Others have been. Jesus prayed to God, he worshipped God, he was afraid when he was to be taken by the soldiers, he felt uh, the pain of whatever, and in John 20, 17, and this is my conclusion, he was talking to Mary Magdalene saying, but I am not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brothers and tell them, I ascend to my father and your father, to my Lord and your Lord, to my God and your God. If he has a God, how can he be God also? Thank you. You want to make a quick response? Or we oh, make sure. There are a lot of things he covered there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, would, I wouldn't respond. I would object. I came, I came here because this was billed as a dialogue. This is not a dialogue. This is the same old stuff with people making 16 points at a time just stacking it up from this to this to this to this. Uh, this is not a dialogue, uh, I Hamad. Did. I object, well, and if it doesn't change, I will not be here tomorrow. Now, that's well, ugly. Of course, we'll but, uh, your, concern, your objection will, will stick to the format we put, and I would kindly ask everybody to uh, just follow the format we put. I believe, I, I believe, to... excuse me, I believe we are talking about God, you brought the issue of the connection, the relationship between God and Jesus. We are still addressing one single point. We did not depart from the point. I want your objection to be rather clear. My Can you explain, Dr. Douglas? 
my my objection is yes we're talking about the point of jesus and god right but when you lay out a dozen different kinds of statements uh this 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 and this then it's going to take 30 minutes to answer each one of them if they deserve to be answered all on the same point so i guess let's stick to one point it, it plays time. both both ways dr archer raised a lot of points well okay. and dr better we have to answer to if, them if it, it plays both ways and we I are would agree. we both are at a disadvantage okay, okay, let, okay. let me move then to the second part i guess i, I still have to I have to stand up and interrupt you. I haven't done this, but I'll do that. Could you start raising one point? Now it's your turn. Raise one single point uh, to the Christian understanding. And I'll please kindly ask you to respond to the point. Just one point. Okay. Now, who's supposed to be answering? Any of you. Yeah, it's up to you. Okay. Or both of you. And I can't answer. Both. I can't answer what he was just uh, charging. <laughs> no, go ahead. See, this is the problem. Well, why don't we can't converse? No, no. <laughs> Let, you yeah, I think it's fair. Wanna, it is fair. Yeah, it's just a second, please. What I want to do is, I want to get things in the format we put over here. If we're going to find, again, it's one point, we just going to go to the wrong exit. And I don't want to go to the wrong exit. I just want to follow the program as we designed it to be. So I kindly ask you to help me do that. Okay. Let me That's get... That's my objective and my goal. I will read the point, and my point is the same Just point the same I point. raised. If you kindly yes. please okay. wait. Keep it easy. Take do it. you want to have a response to this point? Yes. And how long do you want to respond to this point? I don't want to respond to all of that. Of course. That's why we move to another point. As you raised your Doctor, objection. Doctor I Archer does. It. Doctor Archer so does. Could you please... Yes. Go ahead. How long do you want to... Well, I don't know, but you see, we're talking, we're trying to okay. come at truth. How about if, if we just limit Not just it look to at four the minutes? Okay. We limit it to four minutes as we limit it to the Muslim side. We told them not to exceed four minutes. So that's what we're going to do now. It's you to respond to them in four minutes. Okay. Thank you. Now, what, what mic do I have? The, this this yes. Does it work? Yes. Yeah, okay. In the first place, Jesus, there's an absolutely no proof in the text that Jesus answered his mother disrespectfully. The term girnai, girnai, which is used there, is about equivalent to lady. He said uh, to John, when he was dying on the cross and he committed his mother to John's care, he said, girnai, behold your son. Now there's nothing impudent or disrespectful about that. You see, you have to know Greek usage before you can make a judgment like that. Furthermore, Jesus said, which of you convinceth me of sin? There was no sin that they could bring against him. And uh, the New Testament uh, speaks more than once of his being holy, harmless, and undefiled, made separate from sinners. The uh, people you've been talking, or been quoting from, I've never heard of them before, and some of them have not even been named. I'm not at all impressed by a judgment of a liberal theologian. No. And that's what you've been quoting from, no. Jamal. I think so. No. And uh, so, I, and I'm, I'm, we're talking about biblical evidence. We're talking about what's in the Quran and what's in the Bible. And uh, when revisionists come along and try to cut down the purity of Christ, that's their problem. But uh, what we have to do is stick with the text. Thank God that we have a text that, that purports to tell us the truth, the saving truth. And this is one thing that I really appreciate about, the, uh, about our Muslim friends. They understand that only God can tell the way of salvation. And we do not have the right to uh, amend the moral law. It's, uh, and so the, the, the thing that is very important is that we treat the Quran or the Bible as an authoritative revelation from God. Now, so far as the uh, understanding of Psalm 22 is concerned, if I may come back to that, uh, you 
never will find anywhere piercing hands and feet as indicating any metaphor for pain. The word certainly does mean pierce because the uh, translation that is preferred, of course, by the Jewish interpreters, uh, ka'ari, uh, uh, ragalai, yadai, this is distressing to them because uh, if it does mean piercing, then, uh, then you do have a, a prophecy that obviously was fulfilled uh, on, at Calvary. No, the, the uh, best evidence, when you thresh it all through and you look at all of the critical apparatus in the Stuttgartensia um, Biblia Hebraica, uh, it comes out as karu, with the aleph written in there as a long sign, just as you often have an elif um, uh, with a hamza, uh, fatha, uh, hamza fatha, in order to make length. And uh, furthermore, the word for lion, quite clearly in that psalm, is arie. It is referred to elsewhere in the text. And therefore, it could not simply be shortened to ari. Now, you're in my uh, professional territory when you start talking about textual criticism. And I'm, I'm, I'm telling you that this is the way responsible scholarship has handled that particular matter. Uh, Dr. Arshar, I'm not competing with you in your professional territory. I'm simply referring to professionals like yourself, Jews and Christians, who did not interpret it the way you interpret it. You have to settle that score with them. But you cannot quote me something that the scholars themselves are in dispute as to how it should be translated. That's one thing. Secondly, it is not necessary that you have to have the same metaphor repeated ten times before you can take that as a metaphor of pain. There could be a number of metaphors also in the Bible that have been used in one instance but not necessarily repeated in the other. That's not necessarily an argument that it could not be a metaphor of suffering and pain. Furthermore, I'd like to refer you also to another Christian, this time not a Jew, Christian scholar, John Fenton in his book about St. Matthew. And he says that Matthew in particular was obsessed to try to prove, since he was addressing a Jewish audience, to try to prove that each and every prophecy in the Old Testament has found fulfillment in Jesus, peace be upon him. And that is a Christian scholar who came to that conclusion. He said, he actually revealed his motives by repeating so many times. He said, Jesus said this, Jesus did that, so that what the prophet said in the past uh, would be fulfilled. And that's again within the Christian community. People are believing Christian are saying that. So it's not necessarily that I am giving you an opinion uh, of my own. I'm, I'm talking, I'm referring to respected scholars in the field who have different interpretation from uh, your particular one. I don't see what you're uh, concerned about if Matthew does uh, refer to fulfillment of prophecy. What's wrong with that? Because he actually is putting the, uh, like they say, the, the cart before the horse, really. He has got some pre-fixed idea in mind already that he wanted to prove, and he writes his story after the fact in order to fit that particular theology. This is not my statement. Refer to many of these people that you call liberal theologians. They are theologians also, and I don't think we should keep dismissing uh, scholarly word of Christian simply because we label it uh, liberal or non-liberal. They have a very profound analysis, they have a very profound basis for what they say that theology preceded writing. The idea of the divinity of Jesus preceded the writing and when people wrote they tried to write in such a way so as to prove their particular point. That raises a big question about can, their motives. Can we have 30 seconds? You talk for 30 seconds. Dr. Ash, you finish it for 30 seconds. We move to another. Point. I will ask we'll in less. The final I will comment. ask in less than 30 seconds. But uh, I wanted Don't to point another point. No, no, no. I wanted to point okay. to Dr. Asha that I will give you the quote exactly from the verse in the Bible in few minutes you, during the break. The point I would like to raise with you, uh, either you or Dr. Douglas, anyone wants to answer is, is welcomed. I raise the point of Jesus talking to Mary Magdalene, saying, "My God, and your God." I would like to understand how can he be God while he is calling God God. Not only that, but also when he was quoted, uh, when he was also referred to in the Bible that there is only one God and one mediator. Okay, one God which is in heaven and one mediator which is Jesus Christ, the man Jesus Christ. Right. So 
Uh, if you can explain this, I really appreciate it. Sure. Well, if Christ was speaking as the Messiah, and even uh, the Quran, I think, refers to him as El Masiah, then, of course, as, uh, as the Son of Man, he would regard the deity as his God. But that would not preclude the divine side of him being a hypostasis of that God. Does this mean no, that when he was... Please, okay. we'll have to move to another point. So I don't want to get stuck in this point anymore. Can you raise another point? Yes. He got on already the 30 yes. seconds final yes. comment. So okay. we just want to move to another point. Uh, you always referred to the mercy of... Is this of another point? Yes. You all this is your turn now to raise yes. I'm the raising point. a point. Okay. Okay. You've also you've always referred to God in Islam in, in your way as you know merciful but you don't understand his mercy and if so why in repentance one has to really give something or do something. Uh, I would like to refer you to the uh, book of Hebrews chapter 12 verse 7 where it says it is for the dis for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons for what son is there whom his father does not discipline? So if God is there to discipline us, to straighten us up, what is wrong with God asking us to follow certain steps for him to forgive us? This is the Bible, and I'm saying it concurs with the Islamic concept of repentance. What is your objection on that? Well, the problem is uh, not that as there is discipline administered, that is out of love. If you bring up a child in your home and you never discipline him, he's going to be a monster. And uh, so that is uh, the point that is being brought out in, in Hebrews chapter 12. Okay. Now, the, the real problem is if God simply on the basis of pity can let off murderers and whoremongers and criminals and people who have defied him and uh, uh, opposed him in every way and simply say, well now if you just say you're sorry I'll let you go, that would be to make God a promoter of crime and uh, a uh, fosterer of evil. If you have a judge in criminal court that treats criminals that are brought before him that way, he will be the most valuable ally of the gangster element that you could possibly find. There has to be a penalty paid for sin. And so the penalty can be assumed by your representative if he is the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what sacrifice is all about. Okay, you, Just you, a second. You still have up to four minutes, so you still can talk to Dr. Douglas if you want to. No, and then he will. Right. You have two minutes. That's it. Okay. No, I wouldn't need that. Okay. It's very simple. Dr. Archer is giving us the analogy of the judge. But by the same token, what would we say about that judge who tell the criminal standing before him I love you, I am concerned about you, and to manifest my love of you, he calls his son, he says, son, come in, and then he slaughters his son and says, this is my expression of my love. What would you say about a judge like that? Please, uh -huh. may I suggest that no emotions, please. Please hold your emotions. We are here to interact and have a dialogue. So please, if, if you feel you want to clap, just go outside and do it. <laughs> no, uh, you are setting up something that is not analogous at all. Because you are talking about two different people. When you talk about the judge and you talk about his son, the point of the gospel message is that God took upon him, in the person of Jesus Christ, the penalty of the sins of sinners who come to repentance and put their trust in him. Uh, just a second. 
Uh, I'm sorry. That's okay. You're good. No, no, no problem. There, there is, there is a, a logical problem in what I'm hearing from Dr. Asher. For one, God in Islam to him did not accept repentance out of love. He called it, you know, if it is done out of love, then it's okay. But for him, God, as perceived in Christianity, you come and you repent and then he has to pay a ransom to on your behalf. Islam says, no, you repent, you're accepted. Which one makes, makes more easy for man, makes more less expensive for God and more practical? The God who forgives you because you repent or the God who says, if you repent, I'm going to manifest myself in somebody and put him on the cross for your sins. Which one would be a promoter of sin? The one who said, I did it for you on the cross, or the one who says, you must repent, and your repentance is enough. Which one makes more sense? Are we getting into you're, tomorrow's you're topic? I think yeah, yeah. you're fine on your comment, please, and we'll move to yeah. another point. You, you want to yes, make sir. a follow-up on this point, or there is another one? No, no, I uh, am content for us to talk about this more uh, fully yes, tomorrow. I, I believe so. Yeah. What's your next point, please? Okay, Dr. my Dr. next Manalo. point, my next Manalo. point is that uh, talking about the human, uh, the image of God in the human form, God created man in his own image. Dr. Asher uh, manifested in man three qualities, the spirit, the soul, and the body. To make an analogy between the composition of man and the trinity of God in a way. Mm -hmm. I would like to ask, where is the human conscience and mind as part of, the, of man as well? I think that man could be five parts rather than three. <laughs> well, the, uh, the apostolic benediction that uh, comes at the end of Colossians says, I pray that uh, God will sanctify your body and your soul and your spirit. The, uh, the New Testament makes it very clear that uh, we are uh, made up of three uh, phases in our human nature. Uh, I don't know of anybody that's contending for five. But in reality, man is not confined to only a soul, a body, and a spirit. He has a conscience, he has a mind. Well, of course. And, they, and, and I'm asking, why is it for the convenience of the three that you confine the human components into this, three. It isn't for convenience. Then it's what? just there in Scripture. Uh, the, so far as conscience is concerned, this is a function of the Spirit. Because I, the Spirit is able to apprehend uh, moral law and uh, God and respond to Him. That's, a, that's an activity. It's, it's uh, not a separate entity apart from body, soul, and spirit. We have 10 so minutes, has, Dr. Uh, Dr. Jamal, we have 10 minutes to go. Okay. So I would you, kindly you know ask... Brief I, I would kindly because ask Muslims, to move to another point. Yeah. We'll use Just one quick one. Yes. Because Muslims perhaps don't understand this thing, let me quote a Christian mm -hmm. on this. Body and soul are so conjoined that a man is neither soul nor body because neither the soul or body constitute a person. So the question of analogy of the Trinity with the soul, body, does not really stand. Furthermore, the body is not e equal to power to the soul, equal to power to the spirit. So the analogy doesn't really stand. And any analogy that I heard of about Trinity, I'd love to hear it, but it doesn't stand. Okay, the final comment, please. Well, <laughs> uh, I'm not at all impressed by anonymous scholars. Socianus. Socinus. Socinus, yeah. Yes, he was a Unitarian. Yes, why not? Yeah. Christian. Okay, he was not a Christian. Well, that's your definition. He believes in Jesus in a way that differed from yours, and now you say he's not a Christian. No, but this is, I mean, uh, in the history of religions, nobody would consider a Unitarian a Christian. Forget about the writer, look at the words. It makes a lot of sense to me whether it came from Socianus or the devil or someone else. It makes a whole lot of sense to me. All right, suppose uh, you get a quotation from an Ismaili or from a, I have, uh, I or have a to, Shi'i. I have that to, uh, interferes with your Sunni understanding. I have, to say, well, that's, that's I have to open my mind and investigate. Tell me what is wrong with this. Let's not label people. Let's look at what is being said and see whether it's right or wrong. <laughs> to me, it makes a lot of sense. Even if it comes from the devil, it makes a lot of sense. <laughs>
Okay. <laughs> is, it, is it is it is it is it a new point you want yes it is a new point okay so this is point number two remember yes not related to this one no okay in uh, in the book of romans chapter eight there is a universal definition given in the bible about who is the son of god it goes on to say for all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Why would we hold Jesus Christ in particular as the unique or only begotten or only son? Either right. Dr. Douglas or both of you. We have a few for you. Well, this again is a whole issue of, of, of language. Uh, obviously, words get used in a variety of ways. Adam is described in the Gospels as son of God. Romans 8 describes people led by the Spirit as son of God. Um, the, the point with Jesus is that in his case you have statements such as that in John 3.16 and in John 1 that talk about him being the unique son of God. There is a, there is a uh, delineation there in the writer's language that says, yes, you can use son of God in many different ways, but when you come to Jesus, Jesus is the unique son of God. Now, the question is unique in what way? And that, of course, is another discussion. Wait. Please, just, just a second, please. Ten, seven, five seconds. Unique doesn't mean divine. Every prophet is unique. Every individual is unique. Unique doesn't mean divine. You still have, fin have not finished the four minutes. I, I agree, and the question is, what does unique mean in Scripture? And you cannot impose a definition on it unless you're willing to go into the Gospels and to look at what's there. The gospel defined the uniqueness quite clearly because Jesus always speak as subordinate to God. Jesus does not always speak as subordinate to God. He on occasion speaks as subordinate to God, but on other occasions he says, I and the Father are one. And in John 8, he has the expression before Abraham was born, I am, which back in Isaiah is a divine name for God, which is what prompted the people to uh, charge him with blasphemy and want to stone him. Very simple. That does not prove divinity either because when he says, I and the Father are, are one, he also speaks to his disciple and say, you and I are one in the Father. If he in the fa with the Father are one in essence or in divinity, then he and the disciples are one in divinity. So all the disciples are di divine, including Judas who betrayed him because he was present at that time. You are in When we're speaking about me and the Father are one. We're speaking here about the spiritual union with God by the text of what Jesus himself said and by the understanding of everyone else really, not just the Christians. Muslims also understand communion with God. Second, before Abraham I am, even if he said that, that's an assumption, even if he said that, he did not say before Adam, so he's not eternal, he's not God. He did not say before the angels who were created before Adam. The word before also could be ahead of or more important, but more importantly, and I refer you to a Christian scholar. By the way, Dr. Archer, he's not a Unitarian. He's not a Unitarian. In his book called God, God is not, it says Jesus Christ is not God. Jesus Christ is not, that's the title of the book. And he says that everybody, commenting particularly on this uh, quotation from John, he says that everybody, including Abraham and Jesus and everyone else existed in the, four, here's the brother had the book. In the foreknowledge of God, in the foreknowledge, where will is the author, that Jesus and everybody else existed in the foreknowledge of God. You're free to disagree with him, he's not a Unitarian. You still believe in Jesus and he's a Christian. But the kind of quotation that you're giving to me, even if Jesus one time even said that he's subordinate to God, that seems that he's subordinate to God because to be God and divine means no imperfection, no instance that God could be subordinate to anyone else. 
We have six minutes to go for the break. Okay. You, they have four of these six minutes. You have two of these six minutes. Okay. Let, the, let them okay. use whatever they want. I would yes. Okay. Well, I, I would simply respond by saying you've made another wonderful speech. You've set up your categories. You've set up your definitions. And everything works by that. He has set up his categories as well. Now, are you and I are talking, or are we talking to him and him to us? But let, one, let, once again, you, you, you've created your categories, even like I and the Father are one. I want you, my disciples, to be one with me, even as I am one with the Father. And you've thrown that all together. You've, you've basically said that a word has to mean only one thing. And that's nonsense. That's what you're implying. <laughs> Furthermore, uh, that, uh, just a second, check, please. Let him finish. Go ahead, Doctor. Furthermore, that book is by a notorious. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is not Christian. Unitarian. Unitarian. Notorious. Yes. Said, "I am God's son." So he is qualifying what he said. He is not saying, "Because I am the son of God." He's saying, "Because I said." There is a difference between saying, "I am the son of God," and saying, "I said." I am the son of God. I don't see the difference. Good for I you. See I see the, it. I, don't I, see the I think there is a whole lot of difference. As one scholar once put it, you might consider him heretic. He said that 68 times Jesus was referred to in the New Testament as son of God. Not once was he referred to as God the son. You're a theologian and you know the big difference. To say son of God like Abraham, like David. 68 times, not one time, according to him, you check the, your concordance if he's wrong and tell me, not once was he referred to as God the Son, the second person in Trinity. We have this, this is a last, new idea that can last be. Last 30 seconds, please. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit uh, is uh, uh, implied in the uh, baptismal formula at the end of Matthew 28. This, these are not the words of Jesus, and according to the New Catholic... Oh, yes, Catholic, they are. They're quoted as such. They, no. The, according oh. to the New Catholic Encyclopedia, it says that this is doubted whether indeed these were words of, of Jesus or whether they were earlier baptismal formula. And well, this is a conservative, non-heretical reference. Oh, I, I disagree. Well, Anything... You check it. I can give you page numbers. Yeah, I know, check but it. they're wrong. I You're mean, right. These manuscripts. Everybody's wrong. The manuscript, well, thank you. now Everybody you have to go gone. back to the written uh, tradition, not suspicion, that because something doesn't jive with what you think it should have said, therefore it's not in there. Suspicion is based on profound ground for the words of Jesus in the original language that he spoke, Aramaic, are not available to us, nor is there any evidence that it has reached us without any change. They have been broken chains of narration. And that's an issue that's coming tomorrow. So there is very good ground for biblical scholars. Ah, well, I can about. see how we can do things to the Quran that way. All right. We can change we all kinds of texts in the Quran if all we right. use that kind of logic. As the Quran says, We're going to have a whole Bring decision. forth your evidence. I thank you all and we'll have a break for half an hour. Thank you very much. That's why you didn't eat the peppers tonight. <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't need the peppers. <laughs> you see the Arabs? The Arabs before Islam. The Arabs before Islam. They believed in one God. But their fatal mistake was to take... Well, most of the Muslims are problems, which is the part which deals with the participation of the Muslim panel. For the next 15 minutes, we have the Christian about the nature of their belief. Maybe you can come to that. That will start asking the Muslim panel the questions. Uh, I have here on my extreme right over here, Mr. John Dewey, a teacher at the St. John's High School, Religious Studies and World History uh, since 1970. Uh, he is also uh, he have an educational back, uh, background, included. Uh, a BA degree in philosophy well, from St. Mindra College so and a Master of Divinity years. degree from St. Mindra Mindra huh? School yeah. of Theology, Southern yeah. Indiana. Yeah. Last summer he was chosen as the participant in a national endowment for the uh, humanities yeah. seminar on spirituality yeah. with emphasis on the mystical yeah. diversion. Yeah. And then uh, 
I have Mr. Mr. Keith Smith, uh, who has a master in computer science and works at a computer company, Data General in uh, North Carolina, in Raleigh, North Carolina. Uh, he served as a Christian missionary in Kenya for two years, where he met Muslims and became interested in uh, dialoguing with Islamic Muslims. And uh, the way we're going to start this part is they're going to raise, you know, the issues and the Muslim side will respond to their, the issues they raise. So please, could you start one of these? Of course, it's, uh, it's a pleasure for uh, me to be here as well. And um, I would like to start out just asking uh, for a, uh, something that is not clear to me. Uh, regarding uh, really the character of God uh, as, as presented uh, uh, according to two verses uh, from the Quran. Uh, Surah 520 uh, says that He forgives whom He pleases and punishes whom He pleases. Uh, and then uh, Surah 329 says that uh, if you love Allah, follow Me, uh, speaking of Muhammad, of course, Allah will love you and forgive your sins. Allah is forgiving, merciful. Uh, could you please uh, clarify for me how these verses uh, go together? Because uh, in particular, the first seems that there is a bit of an arbitrary nature in the way that God responds to man. Uh, in, the, in the second, it, it appears that he makes a promise. To us, mm -hmm. uh, how is it possible for him to make a promise and still be arbitrary in his okay. response? There is, uh, there is no arbitrariness at all in the qualities of God because when you take references to the Quran, to the forgiveness and qualities of God, they have to be taken together. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says also in the Quran, Kataba Rabbukum ala nafsihi rahma Allah has ordained on himself or decreed on himself mercy. In another verse it says, Wala ahada. God will not be unfair to anyone. The other one that I cited earlier, Ma bi'adabikum in shakartum wa amantum. What will God do with your punishment if you're believers and you are grateful? Which means then, then when God says, liman yasha, forgive whoever he wishes and, uh, and punishes whoever forgives, it is not to be interpreted by itself in isolation as an arbitrary power without the other complementary verses that indicate that he is just and that he is merciful. It is simply to establish his sovereignty, his sovereignty. But that mashia or that will of God is also qualified in the Quran that it is not intended to cause any justice to anyone. The other verse that you quoted, hmm? any injustice to anyone. Uh, the other verse that you quoted, of course, if you truly love God, follow me, God will love you more. That's also completely consistent with that because it indicates the way to reach for God. That if one really loves God, he doesn't just repeat it by the tongue, but follow the commands of God as revealed to his last prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And this way one can achieve more closeness to God. And this is not much different for you as a Christian when you read in the book of James that uh, faith without deeds is barren. Mm -hmm. So it's not an issue of difference, it's just putting the ayat or the verses in one subject together. Yes, uh, uh, just in clarifying, the, the, second, the second surah uh, that I mentioned did seem to, to be very very uh, straightforward. Mm -hmm. It was the, uh, the first one. Thank you for clarifying. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Do you have any questions? I also am uh, very pleased to be here and honored. And uh, I, I come in all humility uh, simply seeking uh, more knowledge. So um, I don't know that I can phrase the question well, but let me try. Um, I too see Jesus as, as showing his submission to the Father. And I see this particularly in, uh, uh, in, the, in the hymn recorded in Philippians that Dr. Archer brought up. I, I see that to be a, a really significant uh, revealing uh, aspect of Jesus and, and uh, seen particularly in the early church. Sorry for my... <laughs> so, um, 
And, and yet, if, if that's that's seen as that aspect, um, I, I don't see that. I don't see how this is is shown. Um, uh, a weakness on the on this on the divinity or divine character. Mm. Uh, I don't. I, I really am finding a difficulty with all the words and, and the terms because there's, there seems to be a, an effort at great precision of, of the words and, and I'm not used to that, I suppose, but uh, I, I'm not sure that I see the, the difficulty with that, uh, uh, with that text. I do, I do see that, that aspect of submission to be very important and uh, important for the disciple as well. There is no problem at all in the Muslim mind of submission. Actually, the very term Islam itself means to achieve peace with God, with, within oneself and with others through willing, loving and trusting submission to God and accepting his grace and guidance. We're not differing on this. I think the, point, the main point we're differing on is that that submission doesn't mean divinity. We're simply saying that Jesus was a human being with the strength of, the, of the, some of the best human beings, the greatest of the prophets, but with the weakness also of any human being, that nobody is perfect but the God himself, that Jesus, in many respects, in many statements of his, made himself subordinate to God. God does not submit to anyone. Jesus submitted to God. So Jesus could not be God. So this is the basic point that we're raising. We're not, uh, we're not saying that it's a weakness in the person to submit to God, on the contrary, but we're simply saying that this does not in any way uh, illustrate or uh, signify divinity. Can I add something here? Okay. Do I have time, Hamid? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. The, uh, the contradiction, the point that you ask in particular about, the contradiction between him being submissive as you have seen him, and him being divine as you believe in him, is obvious in a way that the divine holds up to divine attributes of power, independence, uh, knowledge, uh, being on his own. Uh, submission is someone who doesn't have the power on his own. He doesn't have the knowledge, so he submits to someone who has the knowledge. So submission and divinity do not concur to be in one person. That's why uh, God is referred to as the peace, the as salam, but not the Muslim, the one who submits. But prophets are referred to as Muslims, those who submit, uh, even though with a lot of knowledge from God. But to him, they are nothing, no more, no less than Muslims, prophets and leaders of mankind. So the contradiction between being submissive and being divine is, is in this particular point. If he has divine attributes, he doesn't need to submit and he wouldn't submit. If he submits, that is a teller about him being less than divine. Thank you. Can I respond? Yeah. Sure. I, I see that the aspect here of this submission is at least in, in my own understanding of what's going on here is, is uh, God's uh, bringing himself to our level in, through the action of the person that we call Jesus. And in that sense, uh, needing to come to our level to help us to understand. I, I see, maybe I'm, maybe I'm not putting it well, but it's, it's, uh, if Jesus is to reveal the Father, if this is his task, uh, he's revealing the Father as one who loves. And the one who loves limits his power in order to love, it seems, oftentimes. I, I have a, at least that, that's what, uh, something I've been probing and trying to figure out, uh, how how the one who is the all-powerful, the all-great, as, as the Germans might say, the, the, the great God is also the good God. And, and these are uh, not conflicting, and yet they seem to be conflicting attributes on our part. So that's the one. I Also, on the other hand, too, I, you know, in family life, I find myself and my wife uh, 
at one, as the Bible says, we are joined at, as one. Mm -hmm. And yet, at times, uh, uh, she submits, but we are equal. And at times, I submit, but we are equal. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't see the problem there in, in that respect. Uh, I uh, keep coming back to the fact that we are humans and we are using human language and we are trying to probe the mystery of God. Okay, first of all, uh, when we uh, say that God needs to come down to our level to understand us, I find that uh, rather difficult to accept because we as Muslims and Christians as well believe that God's knowledge is unlimited to the past, the present, and the future. God is all knowledgeable, all knowing. He doesn't need to come to understand us. As far as coming to reveal his love of us, there are a thousand and one way that God has and is constantly showing his love of us in a way that does not contradict his glory and his majesty as being other than the world, otherly, even though he's close to our hearts, which is the mystery itself. Thirdly, uh, when we say, like Paul, for example, uh, that was quoted in the previous se session, that God emptied himself of his divine attributes and came in the form of the human, then the question that arises here, God who is emptied of divine attributes is not God. Because God has the constant possession of these divine attributes at all times because God does not change. So God that is empty of divine attribute is no longer really a divine uh, being. As far as the question of submission to husband and wife, I think the analogy here is, is quite different, really. Uh, you talk about relationship between husband and wife only in relative terms, not in terms of absolute submission. But when we speak about submission of Jesus, of Muhammad, of Abraham, of you and me to God, it is the absolute unqualified submission. He holds in his hands our life, our future. So our submission to him is unqualified as the absolute creator. Uh, what my wife would not submit to me if I say to her, throw yourself from the 10th floor, for example. There are limits, but in our relationship with God, we feel, if a person is a true believer, that the submission should not be really uh, qualified. So the analogy, I think, here is, is a little different. Uh, the oneness uh, between husband and wife really is a sort of unity between two different uh, persons, really, not equal persons in, in a sense of trinity, that they're all the same. They're not equal because one is male and one is female, at least, to say the least. And that's quite different from the definition of trinity as uh, three persons who are equal in power. Each one is God in his full right. And again, the unexplainable question still I can't understand. How could each one be God, but there's still one God, not three God, or one eternal and not three eternal. So I think the analogy does not seem to me uh, similar. Thank you. Just, just one point on that, uh, your first point. I, I meant to convey that uh, God comes to us to enlighten us, not that he needs enlightening as to our human experience, but that uh, joins us at our level so that we can understand his love and that then take that love to others. But this, this seems to me to be the charge. Well, the, the, on this point, instead of understanding, let us assume that he really did what you say he did. He came for people to understand. What happened in reality is that people who believed in Jesus Christ believed in him in different ways. Some people believed in him as God. Some people said, no, he's only the son of God. Some said, no, he is, you know, the son of the mother of God. Some say that uh, he is no more than a prophet. I'm talking within Christendom. So the question here is not really, you know, the answer. The question is a question. If he came for us to understand, why did we come up with different versions of understanding? And if we did, and history said that we did, then uh, wouldn't it become incumbent on God to send something to clarify this? Thank you. I think it's time for him to... Okay. <laughs> and uh, by the way, we have about two to three minutes for this part of the program. Okay. Um, would you please uh, comment on the following? You, you mentioned uh, earlier that... Uh, God is a God of confusion. Is not a God of confusion. Excuse me. That's confusing. Uh, in fact, uh, 1 Corinthians 14:33 says that, uh, and also the prophet Isaiah 
uh, stated that it says that uh, that God's ways are higher than our ways. Uh, and I think we all agree that. So if we try to uh, to understand God, you will be confused. Would you comment on that? Well, I think uh, in the initial presentation, it was made uh, clear that the essence or nature of God is beyond any human grasp. And if we as humans are able to fully grasp Dr. the essence Demar, of God... May, may I suggest that you keep okay. about six inches from the mic. Okay. And this applies to all of you. All right. And to everybody who speaks in front of the mic. And if six we're able... Six is the best distance. Okay. And if we are able as humans to grasp God, we might be gods ourselves. But what I said earlier is that what we can understand are some of the attributes of God as he revealed to us in a variety of ways, including, of course, most importantly, through the scriptures, through the prophets, like for the Muslim, for example, manifested clearly in, in the Quran. So this is the kind of, of um, relationship that the person would have with God. Uh, does that answer your question? Uh, yes, can I ask? I uh, ask one more. The last one. Okay. Uh, on the the topic of uh, of John John 10 once again. Let me. Mm -hmm. uh, we 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 stopped before we came to another uh, verse, John 10:39, uh, that Jesus uh, after well, the the verse says that they again took up. Uh, they tried to harm him. They tried to seize him once again. If Jesus had been negating what the Jews understood, i.e. blasphemy, why did they continue to try to seize him? There are uh, two responses to this. One it comes right from the scriptures, uh, that we find that the Jews were interested in getting him crucified by hook or by crook. They kept asking him all kind of embarrassing questions. They wanted to present him as a rebel when they asked him the question as to whether we pay taxes to the Romans or not. And obviously, if somebody is intent on framing someone, it doesn't matter how much answer he gives. If, if a person is dishonest, he tries to find any way to crucify him. Secondly, maybe some uh, brothers here, like Dr. Archer, may not agree with this, but there are some Bible scholars also who interpret the Jewish attempt to stone him in a different way. And we should respect both opinions, because there is no definitive uh, way of knowing which one is right. And I find it very plausible. They say that the Jews tried to stone him simply because he, he committed blasphemy in their mind because they expected a Messiah who would lead them into power and government, not a Messiah who is conducting himself only in terms of moral teaching and so on. So in that sense, they consider it blasphemy to claim to be falsely to be a Messiah different from the image they have of what kind of Messiah is there. I think it's a valid interpretation. Are you free to accept it or not? Thank you. I think we have to move to the next segment of the program. I'd like to thank you very much. And uh, I hope I'll see you tomorrow to continue with our program. Uh, for the next segment, the Muslim questioning panel, would you come in, please, Dr. Monsi and uh, Dr. Hamza? More than once. And they, they're going to direct their questions and concerns to the Christian side. Uh, Brother Hamza. Abdul Malik. Uh, he's the founder and director of the Islamic Research and Propagation Center in New York. He became a Muslim in 1972, and since that time he has been engaged in Christian Muslim dialogues and debates. He teaches comparative religion at the Islamic Propagation Center in New York. And uh, Dr. Morsi, the extreme right over here, uh, Dr. Hussein Morsi has a PhD in uh, microbiology and he's the co-founder of the Christian Muslim Dialogue and Research Committee in Chicago. He has participated in many Christian Muslim dialogues and debates, including the last that you have seen on TV with Dr. Ashur, Dr. Jamal and Dr. Badawi had a debate with Dr. Ashur and Dr. Shamoush and was aired on national TV. Could you please start? Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidil Muslim wa ala alihi wa sahabihi wa asma'in amma ba'd as-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Can you hold the mic in your hands? Oh, I'm sorry. 
was much more than six inches. So, uh, speaking about the uh, concept of God in the Bible, this is what I understood the topic to be. I didn't understand the topic to refer specifically to the uh, Hebrew scripture or the New Testament. The Bible was the term. Am I correct? That's correct. Okay, so I would suggest that uh, for the sake of uh, getting the basic fundamental concept of, of God in the Bible, that we look at Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, which is known as the Shema Yisrael. Shema Yisrael Adonai Elohim Adonai Elohim uh, Ehud. Ehud. This concept of Ehud, what does it mean? Hear, O Israel, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. What does this concept mean, Ehud, that the Jewish people understood? I say that because when Jesus himself was asked in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 12, verse 28-29, there he was having a, a dialogue, a discussion with some people there in the synagogue, and one scribe, a learned person, came and asked him, Master, which is the greatest commandment of all? That if there was no other commandments, this would suffice. And, and he himself had his own revelation, had his own uh, uh, a mission, but he referred to the Shema. He quoted, Here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. I want to know how uh, Dr. Archer or uh, uh, Dr. Douglas could uh, explain this concept of oneness that Jesus understood that he quoted from the uh, uh, law of Moses. Well, the uh, Shema is, uh, has always been believed in by the Christian church. It's basic to uh, our relationship to the Lord. We are to put him first. We are to love him. And uh, the, the only question that you really raise is what is the implication of Echad? Well, let me point out to you that in the second chapter of Genesis um, where God presents to Adam his wife Eve and then it is stated and they too shall be one flesh and that's Basar Achad now here you have two constituting one so uh, it is a mistake to suppose that Echaz would be the same as the technical term Yuchit, uh, which would mean single solitary. So that uh, there's no problem at all in, uh, in my reciting the Shema. Of course, I believe that uh, every word in the Old Testament is true. Uh, it's three quarters of my Bible. And it is uh, repeated uh, properly in the New Testament. And Jesus acknowledged it. it th that is really the basic thing about coming to a right adjustment to God. He has to be first. And uh, uh, what the Shema is really saying is, is that God is consistently himself. He's, this is against the background of polytheism by which Israel was surrounded at the time and when they believed in many gods. Well, the triune God is one God. This is... Uh, I know this uh, sounds like uh, a problem in arithmetic, but this is actually what we understand the scriptures to teach. And I still maintain that you too and I are triadic in nature because we are composed of body, soul, and spirit. You have 30 seconds. To okay. You can continue if you want. No, it's okay. I've said it. Okay. <clears throat> Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, it, gives, it gives me great pleasure to uh, be here tonight, especially with my uh, very dear and uh, old friend, Dr. Archer, 
And uh, I want to make one correction to a statement that uh, you made earlier, Dr. Archer, that I told 15 of your students that you only know 40 words in Arabic. I know that you know at least 41, but not 40. <laughs> now, uh, somehow I have no idea where did uh, this story come from. I, uh, I had never said anything about that you know 40 words uh, in Arabic. I know that you are very knowledgeable in the Arabic language. And I know that you speak so many different languages, and you certainly have earned the respect and the admiration of uh, uh, whoever met you. So I wanted to clarify uh, that. I was very happy also to hear Dr. Archer saying that he uh, firmly believes in the Old Testament. And I have a, a verse here from the Old Testament that I would like to get his reaction uh, to it. This quotation here is coming from the book of Job in the Old Testament. And it says, how can man be justified with God? Or how could be he holy that is born of a woman? All of us know that Jesus, peace be upon him, who did not have a father, had a mother and was born of a woman. So how can you uh, explain that you believe that Jesus is God from all eternity, yet that specific verse in the Old Testament completely negates that a human being could be holy or could be God? Uh, you didn't give me the citation. At least I didn't uh, pick it out. OK, I believe. Uh, I believe Job 25, uh, verse, I believe, 4. Now, let me remind you that quite a few things that are stated in the Bible are um, quotations of what people actually said. And not everything that people actually said is a teaching of God. For example, statements that Satan made uh, through the serpent in the Garden of Eden. We certainly do not hold that uh, Satan was orthodox when he said this. Now, <clears throat> of course, when you talk about man being born of woman, this is a, a, a common uh, equivalent to how can any living soul? I mean, it's just a, uh, a reminder that we are creatures of clay. We're here today and gone tomorrow. Uh, I don't think that we have any um, problem, um, really, with understanding that, that uh, Jesus was born of a woman, Mary. I don't quite see your problem. Okay, so what you are saying, may I understand it correctly, that you are withdrawing your statement earlier or the position that every word in the Bible is the word of God, precise and correct? Well, what it actually... What I'm saying is that the Bible is accurate in all that it states. Job actually said that. Okay. Uh, is this the Word of God? It's contained in the Word of God in the sense that uh, you have statements made, I'm sure, in the Quran that are not all true. But they're part, there's an answer to them. Well, we'll there's a corrective to them. Yeah, we, we will worry about the Quran tomorrow, but that specific verse. Uh, that we are dealing with tonight that is uttered and written in the Old Testament in the book of Job. Yeah, well, would, I you, don't would you accept that to be the word of God? Yes or no, please? Yes, the book of Job is the word of God. Okay, then how can you hold to the belief that Jesus is God while the verse specifically states that anyone that's born of a woman can never be holy, can never be God? Well, uh, certainly up until his time, that was true. Whose time? Job's time. Oh, you mean uh, it does not say that in the verse up to Job's time? No, but obviously he was speaking. He was speaking in the, in, at that moment in which he was living. I see. So the word of God it changed after Job. History changes. But the word of God also changes. Since no. History changes. The no. word of God it changes. No, it's absolutely accurate. That's what he said. Okay. So if I understand it correctly, your position would be up to the time of Job, this word of God was correct. But after the time of Job, things do change like history changes. No, no, it's all correct. It remains correct. 
up the, up the I, you see, I don't even grasp what your problem is here. Uh, Jesus was born of a Virgin Mary. Now, I don't... I don't uh, Wasn't the Virgin Mary a woman? Of course. Okay, so how can he be holy that's born of a woman? Yeah, well, he means be holier than God. How can anybody be holier than God? I see. So your explanation that the verse would say holier than God. Yeah, that's what it amounts to. How, holy before God. Well, I, 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 I would live with that explanation. Yeah, yeah. Sure, thank you. <coughs> You have uh, five minutes left in this segment of the book. Just a point of uh, further clarification on the concept of Shema. The concept of Shema, outside of just the word Ihad itself, the whole concept, as would we as Muslims have the concept of Tawheed, La ilaha illallah, mm -hmm. the whole was not uh, uh, Kuhu Allahu Ahad. Ahad is not the, uh, the, uh, just one word that we pick out to define that word but it's part of a concept, and that concept of Shema negates certain things. What it negates, as uh, Dr. Jamal Bagui pointed out earlier, is uh, the concept of polytheism, the concept of dualism, the concept of pantheism, and the belief in Trinity. It negates those, as well as it affirms certain, certain other things. But now, I'd like to get your, your understanding, uh, uh, some feedback concerning these statements from Jesus' lips. Uh, in Mark chapter 10, verse 18, uh, when someone asked Jesus, Good Master, what good thing must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus, before he answered the specific question, made an uh, observation and a correction of something that was being done wrong. So he said to the man, because the man had knelt to him and asked him, he said, Why call up thou me good? There is none good but one. Who? God. <laughs> And also in John chapter 17. Wait a minute, wait a minute. I just, wait a I'll minute. give you both and then you can answer them. I yeah, just but it's like one at a right time. Here. Okay, no, There's you can an answer. answer. Okay, just a second. Okay. Let me do this, okay? I can do that. Go ahead, please, and answer that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What Jesus was saying is, do you understand what, you, what you're committing yourself to when you call me good? There's only one who is pure good and that's God. And the, this is perfectly compatible with Jesus being the God-man. Of course he could say this. Now what's your other verse? Okay, uh, we'll leave that there for a minute. Uh, John chapter 17, verse 3. Jesus said, This is life eternal, that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, third person, whom thou hast sent. Right. Well, the fine. only true God. Yes. And Jesus Christ, whom thou, the only true God, has sent. Sure. Well, this, uh, this is sent from the only true God. That is, uh, the Messiah comes from the only true God. And uh, he is pointing out that uh, a saving faith will include knowing God and the Rasul whom he has sent. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, my, my question would be directed uh, to uh, Dr. Douglas that uh, there is uh, a lot of difficulty as you can see on the Muslim understanding of the doctrine of Trinity. And uh, I don't mean to uh, beat a dead horse here, but I have the exact text of the Athanasian Creed. And uh, I, like, I like to read it for you, and I like to your comments on the uh, language of it. Of course, that was in Greek, so you have the exact text. Well, I, I, I'm not as knowledgeable as you are. I did not learn uh, Greek. I, I can only read in English. Okay. And this is uh, the language that is being given the to the hundreds of millions of Christians who read and understand the English. And I am not, uh, nobody have ever told me that these millions of Christians have to learn Greek to understand it. This is given to them every day in this country in the English language. But it's a good idea to learn Greek. Okay, I, I, I agree with you. This is a commercial. Uh, yeah. 
Let me uh, let me read the uh, translation that's being taught in uh, in the churches here in English. There is one person of the Father, another of the Son, and another of the Holy Ghost. But the Godhead of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost is all one. The glory equal. The majesty co-eternal. The Father is God. The Son is God. And the Holy Spirit is God. That does not seem to be speaking here, at least in the English translation that's being preached in the churches, that is speaking about attributes of one God, or it's speaking about three different persons, literally, actually, and honestly, is speaking about three different gods. Okay. I think we ran out of time, so this no. is the last... Mm-hmm. No, not, not, not at all. This, uh, uh, this may be um, an understanding that you gain from reading it. This has not been the historic Christian understanding of those words, however confusing they may be to you. They have not been to multitudes of Christians down through the ages, in turn confusing in the sense of setting forth three gods. Now if you said to the average Christian, explain this to me logically, they might have a great deal of difficulty doing so, but that's a totally different, uh, totally different issue. Okay, I'd like to thank you very much. Thank you. And now we'll uh, move to the last segment of this program, which is the question from the audience from you over here. So if you have a question, we want a question now to the Muslim side. Uh, what I have is more of a comment. He said that he needed an um, analogy of the Trinity. I, no, I'm, I may need help because, of course, I'm not this great scholar. The way it was taught to me was you think of water, ice, and steam. No matter how you break it down, you have H2O, okay? And someone may say you have an ice cube. That's a solidified form of water. When we talk about the Trinity, we talk about three different forms. Jesus was the flesh representation of God. Okay? We're not trying to say that God said, okay, we're going to give her a sperm and an egg and fertilize it and make this baby like I would conceive a child. What we're trying to say is it's just a flesh representation. God felt like we needed someone to come in and try to help us out. Now, had he sent a dog or a cat, there's no way that people could have related to a dog or a cat. So what he did was sent someone in a form that we could understand and relate to. The only way we can relate to anything is to be as like us. Okay, you understand what I'm saying? So what he did was send a man to, to be able to administer the word and get people to try to understand. And that was the, he asked what was the purpose of the, the body of Jesus. It was the purpose to be a represent, representation of his word, okay? We're not saying that he Can you make it short, please? Yeah, I'm just trying to... He said he needed an analogy, and I think okay. that analogy is perfect. Water, steam, and ice. It's still H2O, no matter how you break it down. Yeah. And had the Lord God sent a dog or a cat to help those people out, it wouldn't have worked, so he needs to send a man. Okay, Thank you. with all due respect, the analogy... Uh, Dr. Juman, before you start, you have two minutes. They have one minute response. You have 30 oh, seconds. Yeah. They have 30 seconds. It is, it's so simple, inshallah, it wouldn't take me that much. I don't think that analogy is comparable at all to the definition of Trinity as read earlier by Dr. Mercy. It has nothing to do with it. Because when you speak about the three forms of water, the same amount of water would not exist in the three forms at the same time. But it is upheld that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit exist simultaneously at the same time. Thirdly, even if you assume, and I might strengthen your argument and then make a rebuttal. Suppose you say, no, in, in cold winter you could have frozen water, liquid underneath, and steam above. Here, again, the analogy is not quite right. Why? Because for the same volume, for a given volume of water, let's say one gallon of water, it is divided into three parts. One part liquid, one part frozen, one part vapor. And the definition of Trinity doesn't say that one-third of God is Father, one-third is Son, one-third of Holy Spirit. So the analogy doesn't really stand.
Well, all human beings are composed of cells. Your liver is composed of cell. The uh, the brain is composed of cell, and the eyes composed of cell. They they have the same essential ingredients, but it doesn't mean again it doesn't meet the definition of the Trinity of three persons existing eternally, simultaneously with each other, and having the same power. That's not the case. Can we let uh, Doctor Douglas? I'm sure he will do a good job. Can it? Why don't we let him? Uh, can I just add one? Because we already consumed the two minutes. I can't. Yeah, we consumed so. it. Fair enough. No. Yeah. Go ahead, Doctor Douglas and Doctor Ashley. Yes. You have one minute to respond to it, and then they have 30 seconds. But isn't the question for us now? Yeah. That's well. Be comfortable. I'll, okay. I'll do my job with the rest. Well, I I would simply respond by by saying that. Uh, uh, all, all analogies, some analogies are more useful than others and all analogies has their limitations and I think Dr. Badawi when he moves this on to you know ice water and steam and the different sizes and so forth you, you've pushed it too far and it becomes absurd and everything becomes absurd if you push it a bit far and so uh, the, the analogy is useful to a degree as our many others, but uh, frankly, uh, the New Testament is using an analogy when it says Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's simply an analogy. Thank you. You have 30 seconds. Uh, you're a shaker. Like a well, uh, when, uh, before Jesus coming, the Jews did not expect God to come. The Jews were learned people, and uh, they knew prophets for ages. They had prophets. They killed ones. They accepted others for their own reasons, they did not expect God coming in any format. They asked him, are you the prophet? Are you the Messiah? They asked him a specific set of questions. So they were not expecting that God, out of mercy, will now decide to come in a human form. That was not the expected image uh, by the Jews. And this was one of the reasons of rejecting the, the analogical uh, parables that were offered by Jesus Christ, even though wrong. Thank uh, you. By them not accepting it. Thank you. Now, may I, have, may I have a question to the Christian panel? You come over here, please. Uh, sir, I just, just very quick, uh, very quickly, I'd like to uh, comment before uh, I submit my question to uh, the issue that you started, with Dr. Archer, about America. Uh, certainly, we have to realize here that when Mayflower came to Plymouth, it has the one that was running away. Uh, for religious persecution and it had the criminal as well. So Mayflower did not come with decent innocent people and I believe the American history proves very well that we have both sides. We have the criminal who, put, who killed the Indians and still put them in re, uh, reservations and we have the one who uh, enslaved the, the blacks. So I believe the issue of America like the free country for everybody I believe we have to be careful because some people who are American citizens yet in this country in 1992 still suffering from lack of their freedom. That's my question point. is, my question is, if you tell me I have a problem with the Trinity like any other Muslim certainly, if you tell me that uh, God created man and then he sent man to earth and later on God the creator found out that he can't communicate with that man. It's one, it's, it seems to me like that kind of God, he doesn't know what he's doing. Because he created something, but he doesn't know how to communicate with it. So to correct his mistake, he had to come in the shape of a man, which is easy. I believe God can do that. And then he comes to die, despite the fact of death. Okay. Is it possible to say that God can, in order to save the animal kingdom, can come in the shape of a monkey or a cow to save the animal kingdom? Thank you. Thank you. You have two, uh, two minutes and they have one minute and then you have the 30 second final response. Well, I'm not sure that uh, animals are included in the uh, uh, moral responsibility that human beings are since uh, animals are not created in the image of God. But uh, I see a marvelous planning on God's part that started with the promise that was uh, given to Eve that the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. And then in the fullness of times, when the stage was right, when uh, there was one 
government, the Roman government, uh, when there was a language that was widely understood, which was Greek, by the way. Uh, this was the ideal time for Christ to come and to train his disciples and make known to the Roman world the uh, riches of God's grace through his son who died for uh, sinful mankind. I think that's a sublime wisdom. It all makes beautiful sense. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Badawi, you have one minute. Okay, go ahead. See, you try with the analogies, and Dr. Uh, Douglas says they have the limitations. You try to use a text, and the text has its own limitation. You try to use another text, say, let us use the Quran. That is out of, you know, it's, it's not even going to explain it because the Quran refutes the whole issue of Trinity and polytheism and all of that. You try to use your own analogy to understand it and to live with it, then you have to use very stretched imagination to live with this. And to do that, you become what I would call a fit Christian, somebody who can live with it and not really try to dig in it. Okay? The, the analogy about the Trinity is one that people have, you know, uh, grappled with for years, centuries. Okay, and until today, and they will continue to. It is my humble contention, however, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God, after a few hundred years of this confusion of who Jesus God is, who God is, the relationship between the two, He sent another messenger. Likewise, He sent Jesus, He sent another messenger to clarify the whole confusion. If Thank people you. don't want to accept it, that's fine. Thank you. You have 30 seconds. Uh, okay, let me quote Dr. Man. Jamal, I'm sorry. Me? Can or you what? wait, please? Uh, oh, sorry. Dr. Oh, Douglas, oh, they have oh, 30 sorry. seconds. Oh, I'm sorry. You have, you have, okay. We need a question, if anybody has a question to the, uh, can you come over here to the Muslim side? A question to the Muslim side. This is to the Muslim side. The Muslim side? Yes. No, sorry. Yes, go ahead. Assalamu alaikum. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Archer had uh, said twice in, during the evening that there is, quote, a radical evil in the human heart. I would like to know um, how does Islam view man's soul? Is it inherently evil? Is there a original sin or something like that? Thank you. Okay. Uh, turn this, since this is coming from you, from you as a Muslim, you will have two minutes in response. Okay. Well, very briefly, even though that would overlap with tomorrow's topic, mm. I do not detect in the Quran any statement that the human beings are inherently evil or inherently angelic. The Quran clearly indicates that God endowed the human being with the qualities of recognizing good and evil, with the potential of obeying or disobeying God. And that is the real challenge that makes them different from animals. And as such, we do not as Muslims believe in any concept of original sin that is to be inherited by the descendants of Adam and Eve. The Quran makes it clear that it, each soul is responsible for its own. Pardon? Yeah. So in that sense, uh, the, uh, there is nothing inherently or absolutely good or evil. There is the potential of being better than engines or lower than animals. You have one minute. You okay. can continue. Can, yes. Okay. In fact, uh, not only the Quran uh, refutes that position, but also you read in the book of Ezekiel 29:30 and on. You read in the book of Jeremiah uh, 1, uh, chapter 4, 1 and on, and you read what is stated there that. Uh, you're not going to use this proverb in the land of Israel. The fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. In a way, the Bible is instructing people not to draw the sins of the fathers on the children. Okay? Don't give any implication of that. Uh, so uh, there is a straightforward uh, forbidding of that attitude. Uh, it also goes on to say, the uh, the wickedness of the wicked will be on the wicked and the righteous of the righteous will be for the righteous it doesn't say that the wickedness of the father will inflict on the uh, righteousness of the children it says the opposite 
So not only from a, a Quranic standpoint, but from a biblical direction, you can find that man has both inclinations. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Douglas or Dr. Asha? Well, I have two minutes. Or both of you can take one minute. The point in these passages, and I guess the best passage really is Ezekiel 18, if you want to go through that, is that uh, sons, that is those of the next generation, are not bound by the sins of the forebears. Each person has his own opportunity to respond to the uh, call of God and to respect the moral law. Now there's nothing in uh, in this that uh, negates the doctrine of original sin. Original sin means that Adam, uh, being the federal head of the human race and being disobedient to God, uh, passed on a heritage to the rest of mankind, a propensity towards evil. And uh, if you recall your own development or the development of your children or anybody else, you know that there is a, a real battle there that can only be uh, accounted for by uh, nothing so simplistic as saying, well, if I know what is right, I'm going to do it. Unfortunately, that's not the way we're made. We need to have a change of heart so that we may uh, give our hearts to the Lord and live for him instead of for ourselves. Can you hold this mic? Mm -hmm. Deal with it tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. First, I hope that my English language will be okay to express my question. Uh, my question for uh, Dr. Arsha. Uh, the first, I received from him, as a matter of fact, two concepts about the oneness of God in Christianity. The first uh, part of his speech to us emphasizes to us that Christianity doesn't believe in Trinity or three partners for the Almighty Creator, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And to emphasize this fact to us, he told us that the relationship between God the Father and the Son is used figuratively or as a metaphor. Uh, and or he also provided us with example with an example from the Arabic language, Duma. For that we should not understand the, the relationship between God the Father and the God the Son as a physical type of relationship. It is a figurative type of relationship. Can you first the question regarding this point to elaborate for us the type of relationship between God the Almighty Creator and the Holy Spirit? Because this is another partner. If it is a relationship was used figuratively with regard to the Son, how this is going to be to work with regard to the Holy Spirit? Well, the right from the beginning in Genesis, you have, first of all, God creating the heavens and the earth. That, that's uh, Elohim which would be about equivalent to Allah. Uh, and then you have God speaking, let there be light. Okay. Now, when the word went forth, that was the kalimat okay. Allah. And then you have the Holy, you have the Spirit of God brooding over the face of the waters. So all of the Trinity were involved in the work of creation. My question exactly. There is here a metaphor used, or star in Arabic, or figuratively used to elaborate it through it, the relationship between the father and the son. It is not a biological relationship. It is not a factual use for the word. This is what you conveyed to okay, us. So it, the is, point? it is not a factual use for the word. It is a type of metaphor. How this is can be elaborated to work with the third partner, the Holy Spirit, with regard to his relationship with the Creator? Okay, Dr. Asher. Well, the is my question clear? Somebody can help me in English. Well, I don't. I, don't I can put it in Arabic. What your problem my English is, is not. You're, you're talking I'm about confused. metaphor, and uh, when we speak of the Church being the Bride of Christ. Uh -huh. 
or we speak of ourselves as belonging to the body of Christ, if we're members of the church, we're, we're speaking a metaphorical language, but that doesn't mean we're not saying something. That is meaningful. Can we, can we come to a okay. conclusion to this? But, I'll let you speak for the next 30 the, seconds. The point, yes. Okay, go because ahead and make it. It is metaphorical with regard to the relationship between the Father and the Son. Right. But it's a factual relationship between the Father and the Holy Spirit. Sure. That means the relationship between the Father and the Son is different from the relationship between the Father and the Holy Spirit. I there are two levels. That means it is not the same type of relationship connecting between all the three partners. There is a type of figurative so. use between Father and the Son and the factual use between the Father and the Holy Spirit. Is okay. my understanding correct? I don't, I don't see what your problem is. Um, Jesus said, go into all the world and baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They all are together. Okay, here is the contradiction. Can, can I, may I yes. just suggest to move to the Muslim side? Maybe okay. they will help in clearing this point. Okay, the other point, let me to move uh, to the second may point. I suggest, the may I suggest to wait Come until they okay. respond? Okay. Uh, in the uh, traditional brevity, in Encyclopedia Britannica, uh, 1973 edition, volume 22, page 20, 241. It addresses this issue about the distinctiveness of the three persons and their unity and say the biggest problem for Trinity is trying to reconcile this consideration together. And it says if we speak about the three persons in Trinity as distinct, that is the Father is not the same as the person of the Son and the Holy Spirit, that would be at the expense of unity. And if you emphasize unity, it would be at the expense of distinctiveness, which actually boils down to saying that when we say three persons in one or Jesus is one with God it has one of two meanings either real or figurative if it is real we have seen the tremendous problem of contradiction when we insist it is real as theologians have insisted if we take the relationship as figurative then what prevents us from believing that this relationship exists with all other human beings as well anyone can be united with God in terms of a spiritual community whether prophets or even ordinary pious people, and why stop at one particular figure? And that is actually what led many uh, contemporary theologians, I, it's not nameless by the way, uh, Maurice That's White. We Can we make it shorter? Uh, yeah, just two lines. It says, when one is asked to believe something which one cannot even spell out at all in intelligible term, it is right to stop and push the questioning one stage further back. Are we sure that the concept of incarnate being one who is both fully God and fully man is after all an intelligible concept and he's not a unitarian. Thank you. Uh, final comment from the uh, Anglican. Uh, Do you have any final comment? The question was Who to you. Who are you addressing? You. You oh, are yes. Dr. Oh, sure. Well, believe me, there was a, a lot of controversy and discussion by a whole lot of learned Greeks before they ever came to the decision they did at the Council of Nicaea. And it was uh, not just somebody's harebrained idea, but it was the uh, judgment of the Council that when you put everything together that the Bible has to say in the subject, this is what it adds up to. Now to say, because you can't understand it, it can't be true. Let me take you back to, uh, say, 1930. You and I would never have believed that such a thing as television could take place. <clears throat> but that doesn't mean that it couldn't happen. Dr. Rashu, Yeah. can I suggest to end this segment? May I, uh, Brother okay. Mustafa? Uh, can, can we just... Okay, as you, I am ready to follow the, your instructions. You made him a promise. Let him stay. If I okay. want me to continue my questions, sure. I will. Well, okay. make a final comment and please. Uh, okay. Uh, that, uh, to tell you the truth, I don't uh, want to see you standing here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the second question dealing with a point that has been raised during the comment of Brother Jamal, when he said, if it is a relationship between the Father and the Jesus, peace be upon him, is a figurative use, what is going to prevent is this type of figurative use to involve all the human beings? especially the Bible itself. 
refers to the other people as children of God. And in this case, of course, we have to modify our concept regarding the Trinity itself. Thank you. Well, the answer is that uh, you have to distinguish between God the Son and the Son of Man. Your problem uh, does not come up unless you confuse the two. Uh, what we have in the Holy Trinity is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and they are metaphorical, to be sure. But you have not really different persons. You have hypostases. And I still feel that the analogy between that and the way you and I are made up of uh, spirit, soul, and bodily nature is, is perfectly intelligible. Now, so far as the sons of God are concerned, let me answer the, the latter part. This is always a secondary thing. We become sons of God when we become united by faith with the Son of God. Okay, I guess we, ca we came to the end of this uh, yeah, portion. I'm sorry, okay. I'll, I'll have to cut it Another over here. Question? I'm sorry. May I, may I suggest? One? I'm sorry Second. for that, uh, but uh, maybe tomorrow we'll have plenty sure. of time to do that. We'll come back tomorrow. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Well, <laughs> we uh, almost ran out of time. So I apologize to <laughs> you, but just a second, please. Because we almost run out of time. What I would like to do is uh, have a one minute final comment on what was said today from each of the uh, panelists over here. We can start with uh, Dr. Asher and then Shakir and then uh, and tomorrow we'll alternate. Well, my comment, I don't know which is live here, this one here. My comment is that this has been a very profitable session. That each disputant has, be, has uh, conducted himself very well I think that all of us have been better informed as to what we truly believe, and we are putting away the caricatures that uh, we may have had previously. And uh, I do praise our moderator Thank you. for having uh, conducted things in such a businesslike manner, although I wish seconds and minutes were a little bit longer than they are. <laughs> in your definition. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, of course, uh, tonight has provided everybody here an opportunity to listen to the other side of the coin and apparently the coin doesn't have only two sides. So uh, tomorrow you will see the rest of the sides of the coin. Uh, in fact, uh, it is amazing, if I may say it here, that uh, my scholarly brother here, Dr. Asher, does express a real problem. If you want to separate Jesus the man from Jesus the God, and he does not have a problem splitting God into three people or three persons and you know claiming unity for the same three. I, I really believe that if we use the statement of the Bible as is, we are much, much better off than adding to it from people's talk, the theology and so on and so forth. Because again, we as Muslims don't believe that the Bible uh, is nothing. We believe that the Bible has some of the word of God or so attributed to him. We believe it has some of the word of Jesus Christ or so attributed to him. Thank you. And the rest of the historians and the Bible writers. So we stand still to clarify this point tomorrow in his own session. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, how are we going to alternate tomorrow? <laughs> You right. can, you can the, 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 the I just let one of you talk and tomorrow we'll oh, reverse it. Okay, okay. <laughs> no problem. I'll leave it to you. <laughs> no, I thought that you wanted to give one minute okay. each, but it doesn't matter. Anyhow, Often. can you give it Dr. Douglas or you want him to give it the first minute? Yes. I feel hesitant to do that, but uh, sometimes you have to see one of the two sides of the coin, Shakir. <laughs> I'm, I'm what are, what are you wanting me to do? Yeah. One minute. <laughs> I want you to minute. Yes, go ahead. Okay. I, 
my appreciation to all of you for being here and to uh, the other members of this uh, panel and to uh, Hamid for his good work. Thank you. The, uh, at one level, it, it is clear that the concept of Trinity is not set forth in the New Testament in an organized fashion. Now, that does not mean that I do not believe that it is there. I think the statements regarding Trinity, as in the confessions that have been cited tonight, are in fact a, an attempt of Christians that they continue to work with down till now to express not only their faith, but what they have experienced in their faith. And to put most simply to me, that's what Trinity is. When you think of God, God is above, God is alongside, God is within. God is the creator, the sustainer, the provider. God is the one who has dealt with uh, the problem of human ill. God is the rallier, the guide, and the encourager. Thank you or change the labels, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This is my experience of God. Thank you, Dr. Lewis. Dr. Jima. Well, I join my colleagues here in appreciating the opportunity, and I hope nobody took it too hard when uh, the heat was a little bit on. Nothing uh, <laughs> personal, but it's all pursuit of truth with our human frailty. In the book of Acts, in chapter 2, verse 21, Jesus is described as a man approved of God. A man approved of God. And that led some scholars like John Hick, who is, uh, by the way, uh, uh, an Anglican also. He says that uh, the way or the idea of God incarnate developed later on. It's not something eternal. He doesn't say that. He says something that developed later on as a mythological or poetic way of expressing the significance of Jesus to us. To us here means to us as Christians. And as such, he says that the idea of a God incarnate might have been an appropriate interpretation in the age which it arose, that's allegorical interpretation, then to treat it as an unalterable truth binding upon all subsequent generations. So I think this is really the crux of the matter. I feel very happy, first of all, that there is a great deal of trend among biblical scholars, not to please Muslims, that they are coming closer and closer to the Islamic point of view by raising a big issue about the Trinity, big issue about what is Thank meant you. really by Son of God. We are all sons of God in that Thank allegorical you. sense. Thank you, Dr. Jamal, and thanks for everybody who attended the last program. I hope we'll uh, have a better session tomorrow, and I hope to see you all at 10 o'clock tomorrow. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.